before he must have had a big head. <laughs> I think it was just in SEMA. Yeah, probably. He does have a large head. I've grown my hair. <laughs> it's my, oh, yeah. Oh, there it is. It's working now. Oh, we were going to just yeah, keep you out of this conversation. Quiet. That's okay. Appar- <laughs> apparently. That awesome. Just keep his microphone yeah. off the entire time. Did you see my mouth we need to do <laughs> nothing happening. We need to do something with him, right? <laughs> All right. Who's this handsome gentleman to your left? We have a oh, good job yeah. picking out the left from the right. There. I know. It's tough, right? It's not easy. <laughs> Uh, we have Joel Furman here today. I'm really excited to have you here. Um, he's written tons of books. He's on, he said he's on book number 12 now. Is that right? That's right. Uh, I've been following your work for a while. And, you know, nowadays there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, keto style diets and carnivore diet. And there's, there's just a lot of different, uh, diet information out there flying around. And, uh, I found some of the information that you were talking about to be different than what I'm hearing from some other people. There's people now kind of touting that uh, um, vegetables and fruit and beans and these things, things like that are, are bad for us. There's people that are kind of saying uh, they're anti-nutrients and it has, you know, this stuff and that stuff going on with it. And um, you know, I'm hearing something quite different from you and and some other people as well. Uh, But your kind of hierarchy of foods, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of starts with vegetables, fruit, right? And then it kind of uh, goes off into uh, something we'll get into later, which you call G-bombs. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, kind of how you came to this diet and uh, how this uh, style of living has come to be for you? Sure. Well, you know, all along I've been telling people that they don't have to be sick, that the diseases that plague Americans are not only totally avoidable, but if you have them, they can be reversed. In other words, what I'm saying right now is you don't have to have diabetes, and you shouldn't have diabetes. If you have type 2 diabetes, you shouldn't control it with drugs. You should reverse it with nutritional excellence. Mm-hmm. You should get rid of it right away within the first three months and never have it again because it's going to kill you. And if you're suffering with asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic headaches, you know, psoriasis, nutritional excellence is not just more therapeutically effective to enable people to make complete recoveries, but you're not going to be on toxic drugs that cause cancer the rest of your life. The drugs that rheumatologists use to control autoimmune disease cause cancer. Mm. What I'm saying is that the American populace is being scammed into thinking that the medical, that medicines are their answer to what ails them, while we have the most obese, sickly, cancer-prone, heart attack-prone population in the history of the human race. Now we're not just seeing diabetics in adults, we're seeing it in younger people. Mm. You know what, that colon cancer, it used to be only seen in adults, now we're seeing colon cancer continually go up every year in younger and younger people. And we're seeing more nursing homes being developed for people who've had strokes at a younger age. So I'm on a mission, and I'm fanatical about telling people they don't have to die needlessly. And the nutritional science has made such advances that people can live to 100 years old with protection against strokes and heart attacks and cancers and dementia. I always say, we've landed the man on the moon already. (laughs) By that I mean, we know the cause for how to prevent all these cancers. We have the information right now. And people don't like the answer, of course. The answer is vegetables. People don't want that answer. They want an answer like, here's a magic pill you can take Mm. and still smoke three packs a day of cigarettes and not get lung cancer with this magic pill. They want to steal the meat and cheeseburgers and donuts and crackers and, and pizza and not get breast cancer or prostate cancer. But life is not a fairy tale. This is real. If you eat cancer causing foods, you get cancer. If you eat mostly vegetables and beans and fruits and G bomb, then you don't get cancer. So if, so this is for two purposes. Number so um so one, you can live a long life and a great play span and a great health span. I love a play span. I'm like a I love to play tennis, singles tennis, and I ski and, and surf and like do stuff. And I I'm, used to be a figure skater, right? Yeah, I was I was third in the world in Paris figure skating in nineteen seventy. Incredible. That seems like a really hard sport. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. But you know, now that I'm older, I I still like doing stuff that I did when I was younger. And I'm better at them now. I'm just as fast and just as quick and run down the moguls at a top slope and I'm and you know, place I, in other words, I like the fact that I can play and enjoy my life and do, you know, and do beach volleyball and do all these things. I don't want to sit around doing nothing. I don't want to I want to you know, I and I want people to enable them to be able to live their life into their later years with their full physical and mental mental faculties. And that's why top athletes like Tom Brady and Roger Federer and, and, and Kyrie Irving are adopting this type of, and look look at um, Venus Williams. 
she be, she w- had to leave the tennis tour due to Sjogren syndrome, and she got better again now, and she got well following a, a nutritarian style diet, and she's back on the tennis tour again. These athletes do this not just because they can get stronger; they do it so they can maintain the length of their careers. Look at Eric Schlappi, who's a, in the Olympics f- four times in downhill skiing. He didn't adopt my pr- he adopted a nutritarian diet. I advised him not to get himself to ski faster down the road, down the down the slope. But so, well, number one, because, so he wouldn't get sick each year. Mm. But, so he'd keep be able to train and be able to race all through the winter. You know, his whole money he made was, wasn't based on winning one, one race. It was able to win subsequent numerous races during the whole winter season. And then his, the people at Rossignol and the people who paid him all this big money was based on his total score for the season of how well he did in all those races. And so I'm saying they keeps these athletes constantly in training and it prolongs their career because we're aging slower. And I'm an athlete who's aging slower. I'm, an, I'm a recreational athlete who's aging slower and loves doing athletics in my later years. You know what I mean? Mm. So, um, Yeah, I really thought you know. it was interesting how you, you talk about, uh, we hear people talking about nutrient-dense food quite a bit. Exactly. Uh, but they're not talking about, they're not talking about it the same way that I'm hearing you talk about it, where you're saying um, it's important that we find nutrient-dense foods uh, that also don't have a high caloric load, which is a little different than some of the, like some of the people we've had on this podcast uh, like Dr. Sean Baker and a few others, uh, they're primarily guys that like to eat meat. Right. And so they're talking about, they are talking about nutrient-dense foods, uh, but those have more calories. And you're talking yeah. about things that have high uh, nutrients but low calories, right? Correct. I mean, you're getting a lot of for- bad information that's killing people, and those people should be put in jail that you're having on your show. Uh-oh. Okay. Ooh. Sean Baker, you need to be put in jail. That's right. They should be stopped. We should, like... Silence them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, let me just answer that. Okay, two, th- two things. One, the most proven methodology to slow aging, the, I should say the only proven methodology to slow aging and live longer, is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. And let me say that one more time, because people should write this down. Moderate caloric restriction in an environment or context of micronutrient excellence. And by micronutrients, I mean vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals and antioxidants, right? Meat has no micronutrient load, has no phytochemicals and and antioxidants. It doesn't diffuse free radicals. Processed foods has no, I'm saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel. They both are sources of calories with no significant load of micronutrients, especially the phytochemicals and antioxidants that diffuse free radicals and advanced glycation end products. The buildup, see, aging is all about the buildup of metabolic toxins and waste products that age us, like, like free radicals and advanced glycation end products. Eating more calories in general, just consuming calories produces more free radicals. The more calories you eat, the more free radicals you produce. The more calories you eat, the faster your metabolic rate gets. And the faster your metabolic rate means the faster you're aging. This is contrary to most anybody you have on this podcast because they're all giving you incorrect information. Do you think it's untrue that we can get everything that we need from animal product? We can get everything we need from animal product. That's the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard. Everything. That's what we're hearing, that you can get everything that you need uh, in terms of uh, especially micronutrients um, from a liver, heart, uh, and uh, the, just the... The amount of ignorance is just incredible. And the amount of false information giving out to people is really um, quite disturbing. You know? it's what, so what Why I'm saying, do you think that's false information? You're saying that meat doesn't have micronutrients in it? Well... We know right now that this, the, the um, type of nutrients that elevate CERT1, AMP kinase, the longevity proteins that stabilize the DNA, are mostly phytochemicals found in plants. And that the ARE, the ARE, or the antioxidant response element that's activated on our genes, on our, on our genes that protect the cell from free radical damage and aging, is fueled by the phytochemicals found in plant, plant foods, mostly green vegetables, like the isothiocyanates found in green vegetables. So we know that each broccoli has a thousand different nutrients in it. Each piece of strawberry has seven. There's some people that will it. say that the antioxidants are uh, mainly for the vegetable itself, and that they don't uh, do much in the human body. Well, they could have a theory. You could have all kinds of nonsensical theories, and you could make claims on the on make on the other podcast. But unfortunately, the science doesn't support that. The science is um, overwhelmingly and irrefutably um, secure and irre- you know and comprehensive that phytochemicals extend human lifespan. So with your style of diet, though, you're not saying that meat is bad because meat is part of... No, uh, I'm saying meat is bad. I'm saying the evidence is, um, is irrefutable. That is, people eat more meat in their diet 
their increased risk of cardiovascular death and cancer deaths increase, and that meat raises IGF-1 to, to um, cancer-promoting levels, and you can't have prostate cancer. You can't, in other words, let me make a few things clear. We give studies more credence if they go on for decades mm -hmm. with many hundreds of thousands of people, or many thousands of people. We look at hard endpoints like death. Um, every study that looked at animal product, in, increasing animal product consumption, so it's increased risk of death and when looking at hard endpoints, the studies we have more credence. For example, not only does, so example, a recent study on 44,000 women followed for 25 years, they, ra they rank, rank their amount of animal products they ate versus plant foods they ate in the diet and gave them a score of 0 to 20. 0 would be like a vegan diet, 20 would be a, an Atkins diet or a keto diet. And they found that for every point where they increased animal products, cardio <clears throat> every point cardiovascular deaths went up by 2.5%. So that those, the Adventist Health Study was published in 2001 showed that, um, well, it showed that people with more animal products had shorter lifespans, and, and people were eating a little bit of animal products. But in the 2018 Adventist Health Study too, they, they, um, they showed um, five quintiles of nut and seed intake, and those with the highest quintile of nut and seed intake compared to the lowest quintile had a 40% lower cardio death rate with higher intake of nut and seed. When they divided the animal product intake into five quintiles, they found those with the highest amount of animal product compared to the lowest amount had a 60% increase in cardiovascular death rate. And right now we know that all the studies in human longevity show that as people eat more high protein plant foods as a means of reducing high protein animal products, lifespan increases, which we see in all the blue zones. More beans and more greens means longer life. What I'm saying right now is more high protein animal products, shorter lifespan, more high protein plant foods like hemp seeds, green vegetables, beans, broccoli, and, you know, and soybeans, longer lifespan. So they were trying to get professional athletes to get more of their protein from high protein plant foods and less of their protein from high protein animal products. When you take your protein from high protein animal products, because the, the protein is all biologically complete and people are trying to maximize growth, you overshoot the amount of production of growth hormone and IGF-1. And overshooting IGF-1 allows angiogenesis and promotes cellular replication. When you're, promoting, when you're promoting excessive cell growth, you're promoting excessive growth of cancer. When you're taking your protein from plant proteins, because they're not biologically complete, your body completes them as, the, as it, what it needs and the amount it needs. It's not going to overcomplete them. It can take stored amino acids in the interstitial lining, or it can take or back, absorb bacteria in the digestive tract to complete amino acids. But it's not going to overshoot the amount of proteins being ge generated into growth hormone and IGF-1 into, into cancer-promoting levels. So what I'm saying now is that we can modulate cancer and heart disease with nutritional excellence. We can get you to a point with a favorable IGF-1, not too high and not too low, with a high intake of phytochemicals from plants. You know, there's no such thing that you can't get protection from heart, from heart disease and dementia and cancer without a high level of phytochemicals in your tissues. There's no way. They're not present in animal products. What I'm saying, a piece of chicken is like a bagel because they're both a source of macronutrients, calories, but neither one has a significant phytonutrient load. Without these phytonutrients that, that make plants colorful, they don't perfuse the body. They don't diffuse the production of free radicals in the brain. This bag of fat you have in your brain ages you and produces free radicals. These, these meat-based diets promoted by the paleo communities is scamming people based on what their if, ignorance. What if know? we're not, you know, what if we don't have an excess amount of calories? Mm -hmm. And what if we're not, um, you know, eating other things that are going to cause uh, harm to our body? So like, you know, primarily eating meat and you're not, uh, you know, causing an influx of uh, insulin and glucose and all these different things. Uh, do the rules change a little bit? Because a lot of the research uh, with, with some of the stuff that you have cited is uh, a lot of people that are on a standard American diet. Um, no, it's not and true. And eating red meat. No, it's not true. That's more nonsense, and that's a more, how should you say, um, um, just a more, an argument that these people make to try to promote a meat-based diet based on a hypothesis, but that hypothesis has been looked at over and over again in the medical literature and shown to be wrong. Number one, the shortest-lived occupation in North America is linebackers on football teams. The amount of meat they had to eat to get that big mm -hmm. shortens the lifespan, number one. Number two, when we look at people on those so-called keto diets, we see as plant carbohydrates go down in the diet, so does increased risk of death from both all-cause mortality, both cardiovascular mortality and cancer mortality. So not saying that sugar 
and honey and maple syrup and white rice and white potato are good foods. I agree that high glycemic carbohydrates shorten lifespan, but we don't buy a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. Just because glycemic carbohydrates are lifespan shortening, or maybe even worse than, than meat, doesn't exonerate meat or butter in the process. You still, if you, if you, if you still studies based on replacement calories, take the sugar out and put in meat, or take the sugar out and put in eggs or something, it might look not as bad as eating sugar, but take the sugar out and put in beans or greens, and you get much more lifespan than taking the sugar out and putting meat. Do you have some so, theories as to why? I just want to say this, that um, <clears throat> it's okay to have a theory, but then you have to say, if you, ha if you want to know what's reality, and people get all these hypotheses, we have to have a comprehensive look at the medical literature, the scientific literature, and see what the long-term data shows. And the long-term data disproves, disproves all those theories that people have trying to promote what people want to eat, especially in the bodybuilding community and among trainers and things. And people are overly consumed with size, and they don't recognize that when you're going to overly consume with size and you're trying to maximize growth, you're going to, max, you're going to also be permitting, shortening your lifespan of the process. We want to maximize fitness and strength and not be the biggest human being you could possibly be. Isn't you using know? like the linebacker of a football field, I mean, linebackers are massive as it is. Yeah. Saying that meat causes a linebacker's death, isn't that kind of too strong of a, like it, it's not the meat that killed the linebacker. There's many other things I can go in, especially with like the dangers of that sport in general, right? Yeah, we don't know exactly what killed the linebacker. Maybe they took steroids. Maybe they had a stressful, I don't know what, all the factors that could have killed them, but we yeah. know that striving to be big and the diet you have to eat to get that big shortens lifespan. So what I'm saying right now is like, like look at me. I'm a small guy. I'm five foot nine. I weigh 150 pounds. But at 65, I can do 70 push-ups and 20 chins, and I'm still very fit at my age. And I have a, I have a six-pack, you know, and I'm, and I'm solid, you know. Um, I want to keep this way. Yeah. Now, I, I, can't, I could get to be 165 or 70 pounds by changing my diet and eat more meat, but that wouldn't be favorable for my lifespan. The goal isn't being to get bigger and unnaturally big. I want to be fit and strong for my size, but not as big as I possibly can be. I would need to change my diet to make it accelerate aging more to get bigger. I don't want to, lift an, I don't want to be able to bench press an extra 50 pounds. I want to be able to be fit with my own body weight. So to get big enough to be a professional athlete. Now, you can be a, the professional basketball players, tennis players, skiers, and, you know, and, and, and martial artists and boxers love this type of diet because they're strong for their body weight and they can keep themselves light and they're really fit and, you know, they're great. But, if you, but, you, but to be a linebacker, as you agree, you have to be extra sized, really big. I, I do, I do what partially. I'm saying is that, if, that bigger athletes, um, we know right now that eating to get that big is not lifespan promoting. I definitely partially agree with what you're saying because, I mean, just in general, mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of people that are 85, 90 years old. And almost, uh, you know, the body weight is one thing, but even just overall body size, you don't see a lot of guys that are 6'5", six, 6'7". Six, you don't see guys that are 220, 250 pounds plus walking around at usually 85, 90 years old. You know, you don't normally see that. So I, I definitely uh, agree that e even – you know, even people that are maybe not striving to be uh, like super muscular, just being big in general, just weighing a lot or being tall right. uh, could be, you know, part of it too. Absolutely. But you're seeing right now, you're seeing smart football players now. They're getting leaner and some of the basketball players have leaned down. Even even LeBron has cut, has cut 20 yeah. pounds, you know. And high, the you keto know. diet, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's in a lot of vegetables though. <laughs> oh, so he carries smoothies around and they're green, they're, <laughs> they're kale. They're not just, you know, but in any case... Um, the point that I'm making, of course, right now, is that, that the, when you're controlling your lifespan, we look at these longevity proteins, what, what, what increases the longevity proteins, because we're talking here about the triage effect. Your body can take out of your diet what it needs for immediate survival and immediate needs, but it's what's going to stabilize the proteins for 20, 30 years from now that's, that protect the DNA and protect your telomeres and protect your stem cells. And to do that, you have to eat a huge amount of colorful plants, all those phytochemicals, because we know that right now that only three things stimulate CERT1 and AMP kinase that then increase those, stabilize the telomeres and the stem cells to replace senescent or, or aging cells. And those three things that extend lifespan are phytochemicals from colorful plants, like the G-bombs we're going to talk about in the future, exercise, and, calor and mild caloric restriction. So eating less calories makes you live longer, 
being a little bit <clears throat> thinner, thinner makes you live longer because excess calories age you, and which you can't be as max, your maximal size because you've got to watch your calories. You've got to under-eat a, hint, uh, a, a little bit, right? And making sure the foods you're under-eating are rich in these uh, in a full comprehensive array of micronutrients, particularly antioxidants and phytochemicals. It's the oxidation of compounds that age us, and you don't get antioxidants in animal products. So that's just, that's just nonsense. You get antioxidants in plant and colorful plants, particularly green vegetables, and the, those vegetables with the highest amount of phytochemicals for brain protection, heart protection, and cancer protection are green vegetables. You know, green vegetables aren't carbohydrate rich; they're low in calories, but they're a huge amount of micronutrients. But I, then, go ahead. I was gonna, obviously, you've researched this a ton. I mean, it's very clear. Um, how have you come to some of these realizations? Um, maybe more so like in the beginning, like did you uh, specifically set out to go to school for it or did you have some ailments you were trying to fix of your own or trying to help a family member or something like that? Well, I, I really got into this because I was, both those reasons, I, I was kind of on the, a competitive athlete. I was on the U.S. Freak figure skating team. And just like, you know, Eric Schlappi and all these time, Kyrie Irving, all these top athletes go eat healthy. I wanted to read about eating healthy so I wouldn't get sick. So I keep training all the time. You know, they say athletes burn out or do, you know, you get sick with one, you know, with a little bit of, especially around um, competition time. I remember one, in, one at the one NBA finals, Dwayne Wade had a flu. Remember that? Mm. Like five years ago? Or that was maybe 10 years ago or something. So, you know, you want to, so, so I got into it to, for athletic reasons, number one. And then I got into it because my father was overweight and sickly too. And he was reading books on health and, and I was young and I felt and I started, the more I read the more I realized, you know, that the medical profession is barbaric and gone in the wrong direction. You can't smack yourself with a hammer and cause it's contusion and bleeding in your hand and go to a doctor and take a drug and the next day hit yourself with a hammer again. People are throwing garbage in their body and expect to take drugs, which we know are poisonous, isn't our answer to wellness. It's avoiding the hammer. It's taking, you know, so I realized when I was young that, we, that the medical profession had gone in the wrong direction. I thought it would be exciting to have a career when I left skating that would be focused on nutritional excellence to enable people to get well through natural methods. And that's what I did. I, so I pursued that career after learning about it when I was young. So I went to medical school with the specific intent to do the career I've had today, that I've pursued these last 30 years. It's been tremendously rewarding. Um, and of course, back then it was a little more, um, you could say, unusual. But today it's becoming more and more accepted and I've mentored now thousands of physicians across the country who are using similar techniques, who are using some of my methodology. If they, they did a survey on the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, who are now as many, many thousands of, in, of members of doing for board, sitting for board certification. When I started, well, I was one of the founding members of that organization when we used to have 30 people at our conferences. Now mm -hmm. there's thousands of people. And when they surveyed them, they said that they, my books were the books that they read and recommended to their patients the most. That was really very um, personally satisfying to the fact that I'm changing the lives of so many Americans for the better. You know I mean? It's really a tremendous thrill, I say, thrill for uh, me, you know. I want to say, you know, it might sound like we're going to go back and forth here a little bit, but I'm just, I'm only going back and forth based on some other things other people have said in this podcast. I got a tremendous amount of respect for you, but secondly, we're after the same thing. Like, I, I want to see people get healthier as well. I want to see people be fit. I want to see people be able to reach a lot of their goals. Unfortunately, when it comes to, like, powerlifting or bodybuilding or, or sometimes, uh, extremes of professional sports uh sometimes it's you're kind of a, you know we've had people come on the podcast and say hey you want to be healthy don't compete because sometimes that when you're striving for something as you said maybe you're striving for that extra 50 pounds on the bench well maybe that's not in your best interest of your heart right right and uh but what have you seen you know being able to work with these professional athletes and being able to help uh, a lot of people reach their goals it, do you feel there's a difference between uh, enhancing someone's performance through nutrition and health. And by the way, just want to say, I don't mind you trying to challenge me and to take other people's opinions. I like that. I like to be able to, because I want people out there who's list, who are listening, who have different thought processes and have different belief systems, and I want to help them understand why they've been confused. And the more you bring up contrary right. opinions, it helps me bring out my message of why that wasn't the right opinion or why they, they have a different way of looking at it. So it's great. So I'm having fun here. And feel free to ask me anything you want. Um, yes, that's the, you, you performance versus health. Yeah. Performance versus health. Right. Well, you know, there are a lot of, um, bodybuilders and powerlifters, even one guy who's, um, Nate Jordan, 
who um, was 80 pounds overweight, mm. was a martial artist at first, and then he was a policeman, and he gained 80 pounds when he was, and he quit the, and then he started to follow my diet, got lean and ripped and started powerlifting, and he became one of the top people in the state, and going, you know, so, um, but, you know, he, so a nutritarian diet, even though it's plant heavy and minimizes the consumption of animal products, we still are able to ratchet up the higher protein plant foods when we need to, to maximize a person's um, strength per weight ratio. Though he's not going to compete in the heavyweight event, in the powerlifting event, but he can still could power, can still could squat 500 pounds, mm. you know what I mean? Right. At 170 pounds, you know right. what I mean? So he was really super strong and ripped. Um, so I think that it depends if you're, tr if you're trying to, um, it's like when you're boxing, right? Don't you want to, or wrestling, don't you want to get super strong and fit and fast as you can, but still be lighter if possible? Why carry around extra weight, you know? So, yeah, I think that this works for all those events when you're, when you're okay with being leaner and strong as you possibly can be for your body weight. About how much... Uh... But if you're trying to be a power lifter and compete in the heavyweight category hmm. where you're still going to be heavyweight even if you were lean, then probably getting a little, a little more food is going to make your bench press heavier weight. So, yeah, we do have to sometimes weigh... Mm -hmm. um, what's that... Um, Weigh out the options, pros the, and the cons. Weigh the option, pros and cons. We can't, so we're, whether you want to say, you know, I want to maximize performance, I want to win a national championships, I don't care about my long-term health, I want to go for a million-dollar contract, I don't care if it shortens mm -hmm. my lifespan, you have to weigh that. But at least people should weigh that with, the full, with their full informed consent, knowing exactly what they're doing. Maybe their diet isn't best for their lifespan, and maybe they want to think about that before they do just use performance as the only criteria for, for what they're doing. And I'm okay with people choosing that route as long as they're informed when they do so. You don't want people to go after something and then look back years later and say, damn it, why was I given the wrong information? Why did they push me into that to just to perform better and now I'm hurt for the rest of my life? And I'm an example of that because I was, as a professional, as a, a world-class athlete, I was pushed too much, which, gave, which got me an injury that now lingers the rest of my life, you know what I mean? Um, and I think I, if there was more wisdom in my coach, they would have not been pushing me to do something that was that was causing me repetitive falls in that way that would have destroyed my leg. You know what I mean? I'm saying this. It's all about thinking about the person, what's their long-term best interests, and being very cautious and conservative when you are going to do something that may impair, impair them long-term. Tell us about the uh, G-bombs. What's that? It's an acronym I just made up so called G-bombs, right? <laughs> Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. These are the foods with the most scientific support that have anti-cancer effects. That's all it is. It's just the foods that have powerful anti-cancer effects that protect the body against cancer. And people who eat, and studies that show that when you eat these foods, it makes you live longer and have less cancer. So for example, you could throw a dart at any of those foods, right? Take mushrooms, right? An Asian study showed that women who ate mushrooms 10 grams a day had a 64% lower risk of developing breast cancer. Or flax seeds. Women who had breast cancer follow up for 10 years, eating a little bit of lignans from seeds, had a 71% ch less chance of recurrence of their breast cancer over that 10-year period. Does that somehow lower estrogen levels or yes. something like that? Yes, oh, okay. the flax seeds, the lignans are turned into enterolignans, which, which have estrogenic um, attraction to the estrogen receptors, which block estrogen stimulation of breast and prostate tissue, while dramatically lowering prostate and breast cancer. They also lower blood pressure, too. The lignans lower blood pressure as well. They have, ant they have longevity promoting effects. Or beans, for example. Beans are rich in inositopentacus in, um, phosphate that enables the immune system to recognize aging cells. They have um, the most resistant starch. So the resistant starch is indigestible. To the it doesn't break down to enzymatic degradation. It about to be degraded by bacteria. Thus becomes a fuel for the development of, th of, of gram-positive and healthy bacteria that then line the villi. And when you thicken the biofilm of bacteria that line the villi, it slows the glycemic effect of other foods. So regular eater of beans and greens, they will eat that mango for breakfast. The glycemic load of that mango is lowered because it doesn't because the glucose won't pass through the digestive tract because you ate beans and greens the night before. <coughs> and scientists call that the second meal effect. So we're seeing, I'm just giving you one of the... You know, beans are very high in fiber. They have the most phytochemicals. They're slowly digestible. They have slowly resistant starch. So we're saying that studies on beans, for example, the Nurses Health Study, showed that women who ate beans three or more times a week had the lowest rate of breast cancer. 
and all the blue zones, all the most long-lived societies around the world, and you're tracking the centenarians, the people who live to be 100 years old, you always find the more beans they eat, the longer they live. Beans are associated with longer lifespan for many, many different reasons. I'm just giving a few right now. You know, I'm, I'm curious because when you look at some individuals that do take up carnivorous diets, mm -hmm. maybe they're dealing with autoimmune issues or IBS or different issues in that sense, mm -hmm. they see massive benefits when they do take up certain vegetables. And I'm, I'm not saying take out vegetables. I eat meat, I eat vegetables, I have a fairly mixed diet. But you see how much these diets have like changed these individuals' lives. Many people at this point who have taken up those types of diets. And then there are also people who take up vegan diets and see massive health benefits for themselves. Right. When I hear you say meat is just generally bad, get rid of it right, or right. get it totally out of your diet, I can't help but wonder, like, can't some individuals, maybe they don't do so well with it and maybe some individuals do much better and it does improve their quality of life? Because when, when we look at, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of ways that we can marry these two ideas, but it seems that you, I mean, you don't want, like, you, not even that you don't want, everything that you've researched up, in this, up until this point has just said there is no benefit to meat whatsoever. It just seems that, that's kind of, I mean, it, it, if so many people are yielding so much benefit, how can we say that there can't be benefit for many individuals out there in terms of eating meat or in terms of taking up these styles of diets? Sure. Well, let me clarify that, okay? Okay. Number one, um, we know that the American diet, the standard American diet, is deadly. And we're not, and the American diet contains 2% of calories and vegetables, 2%. And all the processed foods people are eating are frankenfoods. They, they really are designed by Al-Qaeda, I say, you know. <laughs> Nevertheless. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so people can improve their diet and get benefits. And some people can even be sensitive to certain foods initially. Um, but you're talking about short-term benefits, not long-term benefits. And I'm suggesting that a nutritarian diet is a safer way of removing autoimmune disease and digestive problems and heart disease and other than because you can a person can switch to a high meat even a ketogenic type of diet mm -hmm. and reduce carbohydrates and lose weight or improve their diabetes um, or improve their triglycerides but those are called soft endpoints they're not as powerful as looking at hard endpoints like death or having heart attacks or cancer and we look at heart we look at long term studies realizing, recognizing and utilizing hard endpoints we find that those diets are not lifespan favorable. Now that said, meat and animal products do give us certain benefits, like B12, more zinc, um, more um, omega-3 fatty acids from seafood, for example. And there are some drawbacks to vegan diets, which don't have as much zinc, DHA, iodine, vitamin D, and B12. And you, have, you can't say a vegan diet not supplemented is ideal either, right? And some people do require more cholesterol for their brain. And some people has their, have poor protein bioavailability as they age. Their hydrogen funds can drop too low. Do better with some animal products in their diet. So I'm not, making a, I'm not making it that it has to be vegan or zero animal products or nothing here. But I'm saying even if you're a person that requires more brain cholesterol or requires more protein with pro, poor protein bioavailability, then you still should use animal products judiciously in smaller amounts and not say, because I feel better on animal products, I'm just gonna use as much as I want. So how so, would you like use for an individual? So a person health? who needs animal products? Yeah. They have to titrate the least amount they could get by with, and not just eat any amount they feel like eating, thinking it's okay. And then they have to eat more high protein, if they need more protein, let's say, they should eat more high protein plant foods, like Mediterranean pine nuts, hemp seeds, edamame, you know, soybeans, and eat less meat. They should make bean burgers with a small amount of about. If a person doesn't thrive on a vegan diet and they need animal products, they should still follow a nutritarian diet. My recommendations are still the best, the best way they should eat because we're recognizing the fact that if they're needing some animal products, it should be a minimal portion of their diet, not maximized in their diet, like a keto diet or a paleo diet where people are eating 60 to 70% of calories from animal products just because they feel better that way. And feeling better isn't a criteria for better health because I could make you, because smoking cigarettes makes you yeah. feel better and snorting cocaine makes you feel better. People are going to feel worse when they shift to a healthier, when they remove their bad habits. And eating animal products in high amounts produces excess ammonia, uric acid, urea, TMAO, trimethyl, trimethylamine oxide. In other words, when you have a lot of animal products in your diet, you produce a lot of bact gram-negative bacteria in the gut. And those gram-negative bacteria produce TMAO, or trimethylamine oxide, which is a pro-inflammatory substance for the, to promote atherosclerosis and age of the brain and promote dementia. So you can't get away from this. 
if you want to eat animal products, you have to minimize their use and use them as a condiment. And be, if you're a person who, you know, some people do thrive better on a vegan diet and other people may do a little better with some animal products in their diet. But even those that, what I'm saying right now, is even those that require some animal products to thrive should do so with smaller amounts and use the minimum they need to thrive, not the maximum they need to thrive. You follow me? Yeah. What about some of these uh, foods um, just kind of, uh, I don't know, hurting your stomach? Like a lot of these, are con- a lot of these foods are considered uh, FODMAPs, uh, yeah, onions yeah. and beans and things like that. They can cause gas and irritation. Does it just take time for people to adjust to it? Or Yes, it takes time. And, you know, for example, when you first start eating beans, you produce gas because you don't have the bacteria generated to digest them because they've not degraded by enzymes. So we, if people are un- uncomfortable with that, we titrate them down to the level which they're symptom-free. So maybe you'll have a teaspoon or a tablespoon with a, with a couple meals. But you don't stop them. Because if you stop them, you're never going to digest them well. But if you titrate them down to low levels, <clears throat> now we can slowly increase that to two tablespoons. And within a few months, you can tolerate beans in almost any amount. You know? But um, the trick is to eat them regularly and eat small amounts of these foods regularly. And, and, and I have so many patients that were so-called you know, um, IBS, FODMAT sensitive that are now eating those foods without difficulty mm. because we've improved their immune function, we've improved their digestive function. And you wouldn't believe all the people that are feeling ill because they're t- t- detoxing. Because we started to talk about that for a minute, how you feel better mm. temporarily. But you see, when you take out, when you start eating your diet with a higher amount of real longevity promoting foods like green vegetables and berries, which is a fruit, right? And, and loquats and kumquats and you know these things and guava and these things and berries and strawberries make you live longer. These plant foods that are even fruit make you live longer. Low fruit eating populations. There was a study on a ketogenic diet published right, where they saw low carbohydrate intakes, low fruit diets. They took the fruit out of diet. They had more cancer. You know, we, we, want, we need variety in the plant kingdom to promote, to really mo- be most protected. But what I'm saying right now is that when you stop, um, when your body is not exposed to a lot of free radicals, not a lot of free radical fighters, and you have more buildup of metabolic waste products and toxins in your body, then when you don't eat food, you stop digesting, you're going to feel worse because you've been enhanced detoxification in the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle. In other words, the anabolic phase is while you're eating and while you're digesting and calories are coming into the body. The catabolic phase is when you're not eating and you're not digesting anymore, and now your body enhances repair and enhances removal of toxins and withdrawal happens, and you start to enhance withdrawal, and you start to feel shaky and headachy and weak and crampy and fatigued. And what I'm saying right now is that people whose antioxidant levels and their tissue levels of nutrients aren't high enough are going to feel more weak and ill in the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle. And for those people eating, they feel almost hypoglycemic. They got to keep eating high animal. They got to eat a protein all the time and frequently to keep their energy up, because they're de- because they're mistaking. They're thinking they're hypoglycemic, or they think those symptoms are hunger, and these symptoms are withdrawal from their because they're they're protein poisoned. Right. Once you start enhancing the nutrient density of your diet, and don't we can't say meat is a nutrient dense food. It's not. It doesn't have a significant micronutrient. I've had, you know, it's not, it's, it's low in micronutrients. What I'm saying right now is a, a bagel is like a piece of meat because they don't contain any phytochemicals or antioxidants or fibers. And fibers control your apostat more because fibers can break them down to butyrate, which, which controls the hypothalamus drive for calories. But what I'm saying right now, it's the antioxidants and phytochemicals where the money's at, that are the anti-cancer effects. And then, so when you have a diet low in anti, these anti-cancer foods, you feel wasted when you're not digesting. And meat takes a long time to digest. So people are able to go from one anabolic phase to another anabolic phase without ever having a prolonged catabolic phase so they don't really withdraw or detoxify effectively. When you're eating a light meal of vegetables or fruits or beans or something, you'll, digest, you'll get finished digestion maybe in an hour and a half or two hours, not four to five, you know. So you'll get into a phase of you'll go into more detox. And if you're, so when you're healthy, you feel nothing in the detox phase. If you're unhealthy, you feel fatigued and weak and keep eating more calories. So you have an, a desire for more to eat more food, the more you're building up more metabolic waste products. When your diet is really well designed to prolong lifespan and be high in these anti-cancer nutrients, you hit the catabolic phase and you don't feel like you got to eat. You're not driven to overeat calories. And one thing we know extends lifespan is spending more time in the catabolic phase at night when you're sleeping. And that means going to bed on an empty stomach. That means finish dinner earlier, eating a lighter dinner, and going to bed when the digestive process has already been complete. 
when you go to bed with food in your stomach and you're trying to lie down at night and sleep, it's impairing your ability to repair and heal, which, which incurs where healing and repair and lifespan enhancement um, is enhanced during sleep. And, you, and it's not going to be enhanced more when you... So one of the techniques, the secrets to living long is to stack your calories earlier in the day and don't go to bed in a full stomach. Make sure you eat an earlier dinner and a lighter dinner and, and go to bed on an empty stomach. We want, to, the catabolic, we want to extend the catabolic phase of the digestive cycle, particularly at night. What, uh, what type of carbohydrates uh, are people uh, supposed to be eating on, on your particular diet? It sounds like we got fruit, we got beans. Obviously, there's some uh, carbohydrates and vegetables as well. Or is, there, is there any other sources? Is there potatoes or rice or anything like that? I prefer people not eat white potatoes and rice because the Consumer Reports came out with a study that, that um, the rice in this country is contaminated with arsenic, and they're using like chicken manure with arsenic in it, and they've used arsenic f- um, pesticides on the boll weevil for cotton fields where they're growing rice today. So I'm, I'm told most of my people that you know follow my program to really you know instead of rice, be better off eating quinoa. The, the, the hull of the rice sucks up arsenic. So one of the principles of a vegetarian diet, yes, is we talked about earlier is moderate caloric restriction with a high nutrient exposure, but it's also avoiding things that are poisonous and toxins too. It's also being a diet that's hormonally favorable. It's also comprehensively exposing yourself to all the nutrients humans need. And, not and rice doesn't really have much nutrients. It's just yeah. kind of a carbohydrate, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You can have some of those foods, but you know, but quinoa and, and barley and other things are less toxic. And, and so, and, and also, we, also we're looking at the glycemic load of carbohydrates and scoring them on a hierarchical scale of nutritional quality based on how much fiber and, and their level of resistant starch and the amount of glycemia they, glycemic load they have, how fast the glucose rushes into the bloodstream. And that makes white rice and white potato a relatively unfavorable food, especially for overweight people. might be better than something else they were eating, mm-hmm. but it's not as good as a bean. You know, so we're talking here about peas and beans and legumes as being much more favorable. And that and and low glycemic fruits are very are extremely anti cancer and lifespan promoting. So you shouldn't be removing all the fruit from your diet in order to keep your sugar down because of course, as you probably know, it's the free sugar that causes most of the damage. That means when there's a lot of fiber present, it, it slows the absorption of sugar and the phytochemicals. So like let's take for example berries. They they're diabetic friendly. They help lower the risk of diabetes. They help people reverse diabetes, yet they're sweet because they have so many other benefits. They're so high in anthocyanins and other phytochemicals. You know, So we, we're looking at things in a more comprehensive and detailed fashion, and we can design a diet that maximizes health. When we do that, these diabetics, they, get non, they become non-diabetic in a short period of time. And I published a study on that where, our, where, the diabetics, where 90% of the diabetics in the study became non-diabetic within six months. And they're still eating carbohydrates. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And for, and for example, I published a study with, um, with weight loss where they keep, where they lost weight. I published a study with cholesterol lowering, where the average person lowered their cholesterol more powerfully than cholesterol lowering drugs, but their oxidized LDL, the most dangerous actor, wiped out completely. And the heart disease reverses itself. So when they had chest pain, they had angioplasty, I mean, they had, excuse me, um, angiogram diagrams of their coronary arteries. Those the blockages reverse themselves. People with chest pain go away. They their blood pressure lowers. Also, the one study I was saying with 450 people. That's the one I was going to mention earlier, where their average systolic blood pressure dropped 26 points within six months. Blood pressure goes away. So I'm giving a very different message. I'm saying if you want to ever have a heart attack or a stroke, don't control your blood pre- high blood pressure and high cholesterol diabetes. Get rid of them. Because I'm going to give you a promise you're never going to have a heart attack or stroke. Don't you want that? Don't you want to never have a heart attack or stroke? Well, here's how you have to earn it. You have to get a normal blood pressure without medications. You have to have normal cholesterol without medications. You have normal glucose numbers without medications. And if you're taking medications to control your numbers, you're being tricked because mm. your disease could still be advancing. And I'm saying that the, the doctor is an enabler. He's giving you a prescription so your numbers look good, but now you're enabled to keep eating the same diet to cause the problem to begin with. If your diet was so good or right, then you wouldn't have had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes to begin with. I've seen that before where people take their medication to dinner with them, and it's like, if you just made a better choice with your food, you probably don't need the medication. Right, and, and, so, and, and nobody's talking to them about that. You know? And physicians just do what's easiest, quickest, give them a drug, and this is a more detailed and nuanced um, science today, and a person has to be told that these drugs increase risk of cancer. Take a calcium channel blocker, you're a woman over 10 years, doubles your risk of breast cancer. You take a statin drug and a calcium channel blocker together, even more risk of having invasive cancer. 
you take these diabetic medications, the Accord study showed that when you took more medications, more doctor visits, more um, control of your blood sugar with drugs, they had to stop the study because people were dying left and right who had more medical care and more, low, more medications, lower blood sugar. People aren't even informed. My, my argument here is that if people are in, correctly informed as to how dangerous these drugs really were, many millions more people would choose to use nutritional excellence as an avenue to get well and not just think they can take a drug and still eat the same diet. This is like, so I'm, um, you know. I'm, Do you think there's any room for medication? Like, uh, you know, someone comes into the office and it's like, you maybe maybe teach them that like this isn't this isn't the best thing for you to take, but I want you to take this over the next six weeks. But in addition to that, I want you to read what's on this paper, and I want you to adhere to some of these uh, nutritional uh, this you know nutritional plan to, to get you going in the right direction. Well, yeah, there's always an exception. Like a person comes in with a blood pressure of 220 over over 110, they might need something. Right you're not away. Gonna, you're not going to put them on a on the diet, right? You can put them on the diet, but you're not going to just leave them that way because right. they could be you know person has unstable angina is having chest pain, you want them in the emergency room having some clot-busting drugs or doing some, maybe even there. Not, maybe if they're so unstable that they're going to have a heart attack, you may even want to put a stent in. There's always the emergency situation where you have, where you, where diet takes long, takes a while to work. You know what I mean? However, most people aren't in those emergency situations. The vast right. majority of people are pushed into using, putting in stents and taking drugs when the more appropriate indication would have been to use diet and let it take a little longer. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's hard for, I guess that's uh, one of the things, it's hard for people. I think some people might know uh, that they can, you know, that they have a choice. And there's a lot of people that don't know, obviously, too, That's and that's kind of the main problem. But there's a lot right. of people that uh, kind of know what they should do, but think that it's too hard. What's some of the feedback you've gotten from people uh, that have done your diet? Do they feel satiated? Do they, do they feel like, uh, you mentioned uh, some people utilize fasting as well. Do people feel uh, pretty good on the diet so they don't? You know, because they're getting all the nutrients they need and stuff. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying here. I'm saying that when your diet is high in micronutrients and fiber, it naturally suppresses your appetite because you don't get that, that toxic hunger that you're withdrawing from food. So now the amount of food you require is consistent with the amount of food you desire. You don't desire more than you require. When your diet is poor in micronutrients and phytochemicals, you feel so sickly, shaky, and weak that you, you desire more food than you buy, more calories than you need, and you gain weight. And is you know, a how, lot how many people, by the way, how many people are overweight in America? You know, there's no such thing as an overweight person who's healthy. There's no such thing as fat, fat on your body causes cancer. Fat on the body secretes, the, you know, fat doesn't have a great blood supply. It secretes cytokines and lipokines that are inflammatory modulators, inflammatory inflammation promoters. They make you produce more aromatase. That means the aromatase produces estrogen in both males and females. You have a higher estrogen to progesterone ratio which you know, obviously makes, um, makes you get weaker, creates impotence. It creates cancer. You know, we're talking about higher circulating of estrogen promote prostate and breast cancer in both males, you know, in pro breast cancer and females. Fat on the body makes you insulin resistant. Fat on the body secretes noxious substances. And, and the only reason, so what I'm saying right now is that there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. And the worse you eat, the more you're driven to overeat calories. And diets of all description fail because people don't feel comfortable eating less calories because you have to eat the right amount of nutrients for that extra desire to overeat calories to go away. So it's very hard to become overweight when you're eating a diet with this amount of roughage and fiber and natural foods. You get full before you can get fat. And the high levels of micronutrients suppress the appetite. I published a study on that in the, in the medical journal called Nutrition Journal in 2010. The name of the study was The Changing Perceptions of Hunger on a High Nutrient Density Diet. That was the name of the study. And it showed more than 750 people that as they increased the nutritional quality of what they ate with more vegetables and things, their desire for calories went down and their, their strong feelings of hunger that was driving them to eat more calories was reduced and it changed its perception from a stomach and head, you know, cramping and fluttering the stomach in your head to, to a sensation more in your throat and neck. True hunger is felt more in your throat and neck, and it's, enhanced, it's accompanied by enhancements in, in taste. So you come into my office and you'll say, hey, Joel, you want to have a, this great soup I made? It's really fantastic. I'll say, yeah, I'd like to try it, but I, let me eat it later. I'm not hungry right now. I prefer to eat it when I'm hungry because it'll taste much better. So we actually prefer not to eat when we're not hungry now. We don't like constantly put food in them, keep food going. So, so yes, absolutely, that this becomes instinctually 
you learn how much to eat and you're comfortable eating the right amount of calories. You don't see, you know, um, fat coyotes and, and deer and squirrels and rabbits running around in the, in the, in the wild. You know, they all have the right body weight. And when you eat the right foods, you, you body's going to gravitate to and be in the perfect body weight. We should be the perfect body weight. You know, and, and the longest of people, if people maintain their ideal weight, their low, their college, their high school, their army weight for their whole life, gaining weight as you age is not normal. And everybody in America is overweight except sick people. The only people who have a normal weight in America are people who smoke cigarettes, have occult cancers, digestive disorders, alcoholics, drug addicts, and, and people who haven't taken medications and made them thin. They're the sickest people and make it, are, are thin. It's, it's, you're looking at, it's, it's only 2.5% of Americans are slim because they exercise and they eat right. 2.5%. The rest are thin because they're sick or they're overweight. You follow that? So totally, most Americans think that 70% of people are overweight or obese. But that's because the, they use the demarcation line, as 20, a BMI of 25 is a demarcation line between overweight and normal weight to get the 70% of people overweight. All the blue zones... All the longest of people, look at centenarians, all have BMIs for males below 23 and for females below 22. So, so 20, above 25, but you're still talk putting overweight people in the normal range right now. You know what I mean? Uh, can we fight uh, heart disease, cancer, diabetes? Um, can we fight all those things? Can we fight like all kinds of disease just through nutrition? Or are some of these things environmental and genetic? Nutrition overwhelms genetics and it suppresses genetic, um, gene defects from being expressed. So like Angelina Jolie, who had her breast cut off because of the GSPT, GSPT1 gene, doesn't have to have that. We don't see these cancers occurring in populations that eat a very healthy diet. We don't see the blue zones with breast cancers and things. And, and we, when these people move to America, they develop and they eat the foods we eat. And, and So what I'm saying right now, too, is that the incidence of breast cancer, as an example, could be 50-fold the difference in incidence between one country and another. And we have to go back to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to see countries with almost no breast cancer before the fast foods started going into various countries around the world. But there's even a five-fold difference in breast cancer incidence between, let's say, Boulder, Colorado, and, and, and you know, Wacawana or Louisiana or something, you know, where they're eating all the fried foods. <laughs> You know, in, in New Orleans, and we, even in this country alone, we see massive changes between one part of the country and other parts of the country in disease rates. We see, like, for example, you know, incredible death, premature death from diabetes and 10 times the risk of, of going into kidney failure in some of the vulnerable populations that we call food deserts. And, it's, and, and this idea that black Americans are more susceptible to prostate cancer or strokes or um, kidney failure is almost a form of racism. You know what I mean? Because you learn it in medical school as if there's some defect in their genetics that's going to make them at high risk of diseases. And I wrote in my book, Fast Food Genocide, I showed in the book that it's nothing to do with a person's genetics. It's their food exposure. You know, when, and I showed that when black Americans um, were freed after the Civil War, there were more centenarians, more 100-year-old people among them than the, than the Southern whites. They were achieving economic achievements and... Um, educational achievements, and health achievements. And then, of course, there was a lot of pellagra and a lot of hookworm in Caucasian whites, the niacin deficiency from eating the diet of, of, um, of um, bread and corn and, and, um, and molasses and pork, right? Niacin deficiency caused pellagra, which causes a red neck and causes you to become homicidal and suicidal and violent, which then precipitated or exacerbated the social climate of lynchings that, and the Jim Crow laws that pushed... Um, a lot of black people in the north to north, north into cities where they now they couldn't have as much access to vegetables and, and they start. And so all these problems that we, we see, we're not learning from our history, in other words. Mm. We're not learning that nutritional deficiencies drives violent behavior and interferes with people's ability to be there to reach their po human potential. And this is how, so nutrition is so important. When somebody goes into a nightclub and starts shooting up and killing people, who's talking about what they've been eating their whole life, you know, with this fast food? And, and, and there's a study that came out a few years ago that showed that, listen to this data, it's like really like scary. It showed that people who had candy every day, more, you know, multiple servings of candy a day, more, one or more servings of candy a day as a child where the parents gave them a lot of candy, had a 69% chance of being a violent criminal by the time they were 34 years old because of the excessive use of candy in childhood. That's like, oh my, that's like shocking. You know what I mean? Violent, you know, so, and who's talking about this stuff? You know, but it's blamed on people or their, or their race or their background or something. We're all very similar to each other. And we were, we're, we're not enabling people to reach their potential 
because we're not discussing nutrition and how important the right nutrition is, foundational for your mental and physical development and for your good health. And, and so there's two, you know, and, and all the confusion in the nutritional community makes things worse because the, the um, dietary style I'm advocating and the foods I'm advocating right now have a, a huge amount of evidence to show how they, and we, in other words, we have a unique opportunity in human history right now to live healthier and longer than ever before. Huge opportunity because you couldn't in prior years get wild blueberries frozen in the wintertime and get green vegetables all year round and we didn't have exposure. Here we have the most healthy volcanic soils. We're here in California. You have access to incredible food where you can eat these healthy high nutrient foods and we can fly them around and you can get from frozen vegetables. You know, we have, we have the healthiest foods available all year round. The only unfortunate thing is we also have the worst foods in the world available. You can eat fried French fried potatoes and, and, and you know, all day long. Yeah, well, yeah you can eat them. Everywhere. So you have a you have a choice. You have a choice to be the sickest population ever in the human race. You have a choice to be the healthiest ever in the human race. It's right all in front of us right now. We could take our pick. You know? What was it you said about commercially baked goods? You uh, in one of the uh, talks I heard you talking about there was a link between uh, commercial baked goods and uh, mental health as well. That's right. You know that. A hundred years ago, one in one in a hundred Americans had mental illness. Today, it's one in five Americans had mental illness. That's like huge, <laughs> right? That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you think it's yeah. maybe like? Is there anything with like it not being? I guess uh, individuals not noticing that it isn't mental illness back then, or is no, it just no, because no. there's more occurrence of mental illness now? <laughs> it's, it's you can see it going up every year. You know, there's definitely more occurrence of mental illness right now. It's been an explosion. And we, and I can give you some, but the, what we were talking about is that, that the stud, there's a, studies on this that show that the, that the commercial baked goods and fast foods, even two servings a week, doubles the risk of developing major depression, even two servings a week. That's like one bagel and one french fries, or one pizza and one bagel. Just two servings a week doubles your lifetime risk of developing major depression. And here's, I'm saying something else here. You know what the word dysthymia means? It means Never like, it yeah, it means like, feeling blah mm. you're not totally depressed but you're not too excited about life or created <laughs> or create creative and enthusiastic either and what i'm saying even when people are not depressed it takes away their love of living and their excitement about life and their creativity it's dumbing down people and it's making them feel blah all the time and fi mentally fogged because they're eating these fat because their diet's not high enough in nutrients the, the brain needs a continual supply of antioxidant so I'm saying even when you're not mentally ill, it's still affecting people, you know? So, um, yeah, absolutely. We have a correlation between what people eat. Because look at the, the, the Ill, um, illogical or ridiculousness of thinking that eating bad is going to cause diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, but it's not going to affect your brain. Why would, why would you think your brain's protected from what you eat? The brain is even more vulnerable to what you eat, you know? So it, it, may, it affects your thought process and your judgment. And when you're a food addict, when you're eating all these diets, you know, you're used to eating all the meat and all the, everything you want, and, right? And then, you're, then you'll think, well, I don't feel good when I don't eat the food. But don't you see when you're an addict and you've been eating these foods, you're, you're not in control of the bank anymore because your primitive brain gets anxiety. Your primitive brain is driving you, and it's going to come up with rationalizations and excuses why it's okay to keep doing that. Same thing you get used to doing that you like doing. Food is addicting. And the worse your diet is and the more overweight you are, the more of a food addict you are. And the more your thought processes that rationalize why it's okay to eat like that is almost, is almost irrational or self-delusional. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why fasting has helped me quite a bit. Mm. Um, it's different for each person, I'm sure, but um, you utilize fasting uh, with, with your practice as well? I do because fasting can help a person with an asthmatic. I can like wean them down off medications and as they're getting better and as I take away the medications, I want them to fast to prevent a flare up of their asthma so I can use it as a therapeutic tool. But I don't like recommend overweight people fast. I recommend that fasting be used in the hands of a professional. In other words, when you're fasting and you're overweight, you are gonna most likely yo-yo your weight. It'll slow your <coughs> metabolic rate down, slow ra so radical. That you now, now whatever weight you lost, you'll gain back, and you'll gain back weight back rapidly, and you'll put more um, saturated fat in your body fat, fat when you gain back weight, or get more visceral fat. You'll store fat more viscerally, and yo-yoing your weight up and down is not beneficial to your lifespan. So fasting in the wrong hands can be not 
is not op- optimal. Yeah, if I usually I'm, recommend you, not not starting out. Like, you know, if you're new to dieting, certainly don't start out with right. fasting. Get to your ideal weight first. Learn how to eat right so you drop a pound a week. I'm saying that fat cells and fat on your body is dangerous. And your fat cells are producing pro-cancerous compounds. But if you're losing weight at a kilogram a week, on a nutritarian diet, what I'm recommending, people lose weight at the beginning, more than a kilogram a week. But eventually they settle down to about a kilogram a week of weight loss. I'm saying right now is that if you're not losing a pound every three days, you're not losing a kilogram a week, your fat cell's still toxic. If you're overweight, you're either, and if you're a nutritarian, you're healthy, then you're either at your ideal weight or you're going towards your ideal weight at approximately a kilogram a week. If you're not doing that, your fat cells are still producing dangerous compounds. Deep. Fat on the body is dangerous. So that if you have some diet you think is good, then you should be losing weight, you should be moving towards your ideal weight, and when you get to your ideal weight, you should be staying there at your ideal weight, right? Makes sense. What type of uh, exercise protocol do you have for like the clients on a nutritarian diet? Because I mean, obviously, you know exercise is beneficial. So, what do you usually have them do? Well, don't forget, I may be seeing people that are four hundred fifty pounds. Oh, for sure. They just yeah. can't hardly walk. Definitely. Too. So this enables them to want to exercise. You know, and some people can walk, but I have. But the more variety of exercises I have them do, like when I have a person, let's say, who weighs two hundred fifty, three hundred pounds, um. They do multiple styles of exercise during the day because you and I can exercise. We can go in the gym and exercise for an hour and a half. And I could, I could, you know, go on the stairmaster and I can do. I can, I can be exercise and I could go from one. But the people that I'm seeing, they can't do that much vigorous exercise for so long. So I can give them more moderate exercise for a five minute period. But then I can have them do it multiple times during the day. They can take a break for five minutes and do some motion isometric exercises against their own body weight. They can be just stepping from side to side, you know, and taking big steps behind them and forward. They could be moving, they can be walking on sand or just going, sitting up and down from a chair 15 times and then waiting another hour. They can do another little bit of exercise. So, okay, we, in other words, what I'm saying is I give them a lot of different variety of ways to exercise different body parts. So, if they walk till they were exhausted, they can go back in the gym and they can use a stepper or they can use a hand bike or they can. So, I'm giving them. Um, exercise according to their abilities and their um and the level of where they're at and i tell and exercise is not the main thing here the main thing is to get healthy so they will feel like living life and exercising and being more active because these people their activity and their their mobility is limited from all the weight they have how much can you enjoy that when you exercise when you when it's so uncomfortable for you to do so and and that's why and the major thing is you know i always say that you build muscle in the gym and you lose weight in the kitchen you know what i mean how do you get these people? Um, I love what you're saying because you're you're kind of breaking down the barrier into fitness, and you're saying, look, you know, you're starting out, and your fitness is going to look a little different than maybe what you see on TV, right? right. And you're going to walk, and you're going to do some stuff with your own body weight, right. and we don't need special equipment or special clothes or anything. We just need to do some stuff throughout the day. We need to move around. How do you get these people to? adhere to a diet like are you kind of more like all right i'm bringing the hammer down on this person and this is the way it's going to be and it's black and white or do you give them a little bit of a leash because you're recognizing look this is somebody who's had uh, dysfunctional eating patterns for a really long time and it's tied into their emotions and you know maybe i need to give them a, a, a cheat meal or a snack or like maybe they need these little things in their diet how do you approach it well certainly it's an art you know, I have 30 years of experience yeah. doing this to try to figure out what's best for each pe- person. But I, one thing I know and determined over the years that very often the cheats get people back into their addictive behaviors <laughs> and trigger them back to going off the diet again. It's, it's easier to, it's, sometimes it's for better for people who are real addicts to be black and white, like an alcoholic, just stay away from the bars and don't drink any alcohol. And the same thing, these people are food addicted. And a little bit of cheating sometimes puts them right back over the edge and keeps them continually longing for that food they mm-hmm. can't eat all the time. Well, once they abstain for it long enough period of time, they lose attraction for it, and it becomes disgusting to them over time. But, so, but I'm not saying I'm fixated on one thing for everybody. If you know if I'm sitting for a person, I know I'm going to take them in baby steps because I realize it's the only way I'm going to get them to do this. But some, overall, most people do better when I put them like, I have a facility. I have a place called the Eat to Live Retreat where... These people who are overweight and sickly have not succeeded doing this on their own because their addiction was too strong. And I have them stay in my beautiful place in, in San Diego. And we feed the, we have the best chefs in the world making them incredibly delicious food. And the patients, are the, not patients, but the guests are learning how to make the food taste great. And they're eating super healthy food that we grow in the, mostly that we grow in the gardens there. And, you know, and, and they get counseling and they get exercise training, but the mostly they get time away from their addictive triggers. 
and the foods they've been eating that they lose their attraction for and their taste buds change. And these people change emotionally and intellectually. And over time, they, they no longer have to eat those foods anymore and they're, better, they're able to leave and control their own appetite now. I'll give you an example. One woman, Nicole, she weighed over 400 pounds. And she tried diets and just made her fatter, just made her lose and gain more back and losing. She couldn't, didn't work at all. So, so, so by being here and learning this, she lost 50 pounds in the six weeks she was there, right? But the 12 months after she left, she lost another 200 pounds. Mm. And she wouldn't even think of eating other way, any other day now. But if she stayed there for two or three weeks, she would never have been able to do that. Just like with a drug addiction, you know, just like you go to a have cocaine addict, you go away to, they put them away for 12 weeks because you've got to separate them from the cocaine for a long enough period of time for the drive and, and desire for cocaine to diminish. It's the same thing here. Food addiction is real, you know, and it keeps, and it kills people. It's not only real, it's just, it's killing more people than cocaine and drugs addiction. Food addiction is the major deadly addiction in America. So I'm able to take people with diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and have them totally get well. But also, I'm so exciting is people with asthma and fibromyalgia and psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, and, scler and, and Sjogren's syndrome, like, like um, Venus Williams. You know, we're talking here about people with autoimmune conditions whose rheumatologists aren't telling them they can get well. Mm. They're just telling them to be on drugs that cause cancer for the rest of their life. You know? So what I'm saying right now is that I'm able to maximize the possibility and probability of disease reversal and also maximize the chance of recidiv lessen the chance of recidivism or desire to go back on an unhealthy diet when I can control their environment for a prolonged period of time. Now I'm not saying everyone can do that or can afford that. I want to give I want to teach and give people the obstacles what I do in my books and on my website to give people the knowledge and the skills that they can do this on their own, of course. But some people can't, you know. So it's a, it, and the people that are most sick sometimes are the ones that can't do it on their own because they're, they're so addicted, they need help. People sometimes need some professional assistance to really accomplish the, this changeover. But my message, of course, is that it's such a blessing, and it's so exciting, and, it's such a, and these people are so grateful when you're able to have them get well and stay well. They're just so incredibly thankful they learned about this and they were able to have that opportunity. How much does it help uh, for when people come to this retreat and you got examples probably around that are like, hey, this woman did this and this guy over here did that. That must really motivate the, the new people coming in, right? Absolutely. You know, whenever I do my immersion programs or getaways or something, we always have a success story night where some of the people get up on the stage and they tell what they've, they've lost 50 pounds, they've lost 75 pounds, they've got rid of their asthma, whatever it is. And that really does motivate people. I think when I had my first television show on PBS back in 2011, it, it did, the show was one of the biggest fundraisers for PBS, you know, like the top 10 of all time or something. I raised over $35 million for PBS. I think the reason for that was all these people who changed their health destiny, who got up, who were all those people who I discussed on the show, and I showed that they were people just like you and me, who, who thought they couldn't, they didn't, wasn't a willpower of iron or steel, but, they, but they, when they ate the right foods, they, their taste buds changed, and they learned to enjoy this, and they were able to get rid of these serious diseases. And I think seeing these people reverse their rheumatoid arthritis and get rid of their, even some of the people who had cancers that, you know, early stage cancers that reversed or whatever it is, I, the, 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 the power of nutritional excellence was demonstrated. And people really, you know, it, it, made, it made them open up and say, wow, I got to learn more about this, you know. So certainly that's so helpful that, that if this works over the years, you know, word of mouth and... And the fact that it works so effectively is what led to its, led to more people doing it, you know? You got something, Andrew? Yeah. Oops, my microphone's off. Nope. <laughs> microphone check. Yeah, sorry. My mic was off. Uh, earlier you said that uh, meat wasn't nutrient dense. What right. leads you to say that? The facts. So in other words, if you, you have 36 nutrients that the U.S. government keeps score of, right? Mm -hmm. And out of those 36 nutrients, you add them up. That those are known nutrients like vitamins and minerals, compared to another food like vegetables, meat has about one twentieth the amount of vitamins and minerals compared to an equal caloric portion of vegetables. But even forgetting that portion, meat does have certain things like niacin and B12 and zinc. But forgetting the fact that if you looked at all 36 nutrients, it's relatively low compared to vegetables. The main thing is that it's what are the nutrients that Americans are lacking? 
we're already getting a lot with more meat and we're already getting enough of all those things is meaningless. We're lacking the phytochemicals and antioxidants to prevent cancer, which meat gives you zero. So out of the nutrients that extend human lifespan, meat, zero, vegetables, a thousand. Because meat contains none. So look, let's, let's get real here. People are just giving you nonsensical, biased information. We want to fight cancer. We have to have a lot of cancer-fighting antioxidants and phytochemicals. Wouldn't gotcha. it be very difficult to eat an equal amount of weight in vegetables? Like if you had like a like a pound of meat would probably be pretty pretty easy to eat, but a, an equal amount of vegetables, like what would that look like? Because like something like spinach or something like that, you know, you take a bag of spinach and it cooks, <laughs> cooks down in this little tiny thing, you know? That's exactly the point. Because it's very hard to eat so many calories when you don't have vegetables and natural foods because the fiber takes a bulk in your stomach. That's why if you're eating a lot of plant foods, you get filled up with like 300, 400 calories, you're already feeling full. But if you're eating oils, meats, cheeses, or processed carbohydrates, you can put 4,000 calories into your stomach. That's how you know Skipper never really lived on that island. You know, I'm curious because... Did you get that joke or you're too young? <laughs> I think, I, I'm, yeah. I think I, you I, got I, it. <laughs> I missed out on it. It said it was a Gilligan's Island. It was a show where, where the skipper, where they was, there was nothing... Of, he uh, was fat as hell, yeah. He was fat. They were on a desert <laughs> island. And he could just eat what was on the island. So when he was heavy, so I'm saying that's how you know Skipper. It was an old show. I know you didn't laugh, so I thought well, you were too, too young. How, how old are you now? I'm 26. Oh, God. Okay. That's why. About to be 27. <laughs> uh, September, yeah. Yeah. Coming up. Yeah. Um. So... I'm wondering about this because, you know, when we look at a lot of people that, let's say they're people that tend to already be fairly healthy, also adopt vegan diets, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at a lot of people, they're they're already healthy and they're adopting vegan diets. When you look at also individuals that are fairly active, um, they're eating in a slight caloric deficit and they also adopt these, di these diets like keto or whatever that promote more meat eating. They also seem to be as healthy. So what would be the thing that you would tell an individual that is healthy, they're active, great blood markers, eating decent amounts of meat, not like, you know, two grams per pound or something, but decent amounts of meat along with their diet, keto, carnivore, whatever. Mm -hmm. What would be the reason that you would tell them to adopt this type of diet if they're already feeling healthy good. as is? Yeah, feeling good, healthy, right. I mean, and, and not just like feeling good, like they have the blood markers to show that they're healthy at that point. Yeah, what, because what that's, would be the... it's almost meaningless. That's what, they're, that's what they're brainwashed. The people think, oh, I'm, my blood pressure's good, so I can eat salt. What yeah. a moron, you know? <laughs> Blood pressure is not going to be good all. Well, not not going to be good long term. Just because it's good now it doesn't mean it's going to be good then. Well, who cares what you are right now? Let's look at what happens as people age, eating a high salt diet. You know what I mean? And you wait till you salt. Wait till you have high blood pressure. Then cutting out the salt's not going to have the effect. It's cutting it out now before you have high blood pressure. You don't wait till you get cancer to cut the fix your diet. You don't wait till you have dementia, which is not reversible, before you fix your diet. You know. So I want people to get a lot of information. I don't want to think they can't have a few sound bites and and you know and, and they can't. They have to learn a lot. They should read my book, Super Immunity, because to realize that we can control our health destiny. And you don't have to have dementia when you get older, and you don't have to get cancer, and you don't have to have a heart attack or a stroke. So I'm saying, do you have the intelligence? And intelligence means you, a certain type of intelligence, where you do the right things now that's going to benefit you decades from now. That's like you go and get an education because you have a better career, make more money, or have a, you know, you just want to, you know, so you do things now that are a little bit tougher, but down the road is really going to be grateful you did it. The future you, when you're 65 or 70 or 80 or 90 years old, how are you going to look back and say how you took care of your body when you were 20s and 30s? Because what you did when you were 20s and 30s is really what creates your life and your health when you get to be 60 and 70. So I'm making, so I would be thinking about, okay, but let's see how, what happens to people. And I could show them numerous studies, which we have now. And not only that, I'm, what I'm saying is something really radical here. I'm saying that all the studies show the same thing. All the studies show the same thing, that those type of diets lead to worse outcomes. You know, So I'm saying that the, the literature is not controversial. The information you're getting from people is controversial. They're using short-term studies, people who've improved their health short-term, but the long-term studies and the longevity studies, the epidemiologic studies with large number of people looking at their life as they age and seeing what causes them to live longer or die shorter, we're not, it's not very controversial. And a nutritarian diet, what I'm recommending, checks every box of human longevity to make sure we don't sell some people out and screw them, mess them up. Because some of these vegan diets are too low in fat. Some of the other diets are too high in animal products. You have these, some diets are, too, are don't have enough. In other words, I'm saying that what are all the factors that we have to consider when we're looking at human longevity? 
right? It's not just your cholesterol level. It's your level of lutein in your bloodstream. And it's, it's your certain ones. It's, it's your IGF-1, your, one, right? Not just your body weight either. Not you know, your body so weight, right. Some people think like, oh, I lost 20 pounds and this is great. I'm, I, I like what I'm you're thin. saying. I'm thin. Yeah. I'm thin, so I'm healthy. I don't right. mean all the meat I want. You know what I <laughs> mean? Right. That, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, I really liked what you said earlier about, um, and, I, and I've heard you say this in other talks too, about... Uh, people kind of consuming empty calories. Can you kind of drive that point home a little bit more? Cause I don't think, I don't think that people fully understand, you know, your, your, uh, obesity. A lot of times people I think would think that, uh, when someone's obese, that they have maybe an influx of nutrients, but they're usually, they usually, uh, are micronutrient deficient, right? Exactly. Cause they're driven to overeat. If you're overweight, like to that degree, you're a food addict. And if you're a food addict, you're driven to overeat calories because your diet is micronutrient insufficient, phytochemical insufficient, and fiber insufficient. Fiber gets converted into butyrate. Butyrate slows down the brain's desire for calories in the hypothalamus. And if your diet's low in fiber, you're gonna to wanna to eat more calories. Your and you basically low... just keep eating because you are, you're, you're trying to get something that you'll never get to, right? Correct. And it's kind of the same thing with addiction. You hear people say, you know, the first time they did cocaine or the first time, they're trying to get that high again, and they never, they never even get there. They're like chasing something that they're never really gonna get. So adding those nutrients in is something that can really help prevent that, right? That's correct. We, a body, um, you know, it's called the triage effect. It means this, that when you have a certain amount of nutrients coming into your body, your body will utilize them for survival and for reproduction. So you don't really, so you're getting in 30 milligrams of vitamin C or 100 mill micrograms of vitamin K. You're not gonna bleed to death. You're not gonna get scurvy and die, but it's not sufficiently amount of micronutrients to stabilize your longevity protein to keep you living to 100 years old. It's just keeping you feeling okay right now. The body triages nutrients to its immediate needs, but it's not gonna protect your telomeres and your stem cells for 100 years of age. So a nutritarian diet might have 2,000 micrograms of vitamin K. 100 was enough for you, but on an RDI is 150, but my diet might have 2,000 but the excellent amount is helping me my, for longevity. It's not, we're not triaging the nutrients for its immediate use, we're keeping it for its, the body can do so much more when it has an optimal supply of nutrients. Because what I'm saying to you right now is our body is already a miraculous self-healing machine that can live to be 100 years old in good health with a full mental faculty intact. The fact that we have so much disease all around us makes people think and they're trained to believe that disease is natural it's normal to get sick by the age of 60 or 70, go to doctors and take drugs. Doctors have the answers to our health with these pill, magic pills, um, and that it's genetic or beyond our control that we got sick. And I'm saying quite the opposite. I'm saying that we're in control of our health destiny, and if you don't want to get cancer, you don't have to. And you don't have to be on blood pressure medications and get heart disease. If you have it, it's reversible. And I'm giving you the opportunity to take charge of your health destiny if you want to. And if you don't want to, do whatever you want, right? I didn't write my book to appeal to the masses to get the most number of people to read it. And when I first wrote Eat to Live in 2004, the book publisher, Little Brown, said to me, we could change it a little bit and really make it a bestseller. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not my point. I want to call it the gold standard of excellence here for people to help people who really want to get well and we're willing to do what it, it takes. I don't, you know, I'm not going to write the book to get more people to eat to, you know, so I, I don't want to sell out the person who says, I really want to get as healthy as I can and get rid of my diabetes or reverse my rheumatoid arthritis. And then if I, met, if I watered it down to get, to get the masses to like it, then I'd be selling that person out who wanted to reverse their rheumatoid arthritis or reverse their heart disease. Mm -hmm. You follow me? So I, and then over the years what happened is so many people realized that you could make this taste great and it tastes, and you can make gourmet, you can make healthy food taste gourmet, and they started popping up nutritarian hotels, nutritarian restaurants, and, and the taste buds get stronger, and we put out, so we show people that this is not just for the food nuts, the health nuts, right? This, because for millions of Americans are doing this now, are, are eating so healthful, especially here in California. This is not even, what I'm advocating is not so weird here. Mm -hmm. It's almost becoming more mainstream. You're seeing restaurants with salad bars and broccoli dishes and the kale consumption has gone up. But speaking of the kale consumption has gone up, there was a recent study came out a couple of weeks ago, so there's like from um, environmental working groups, so there's 18 different pesticides they're putting on kale today. A lot of residual, you know, you got to get organic kale now. Right. You know what I mean? And the, and, the and the brown rice has arsenic in it, and the flax seeds have cadmium in it. So, so we have to watch about, what, about make, protecting our environment, making sure our growers and the farmers are using clean. You know, we, we're really looking at all aspects of health here, and they're trying to avoid the use of chemical substances. And as you know, the 
you know, the Roundup and the glyphosate mm-hmm. on foods is all. We all have a lot of food contamination going on here. Do you get your uh, blood work done? I do blood work on my on my guests. I've had my blood work done occasionally for an insurance exam, mm-hmm. you know, but I don't usually routinely draw blood on myself. And what about like some of the people that you? I don't. Uh, not that I don't like doctors. I or I don't. Yeah. Even, I could say I don't even like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to just willy nilly take take my blood. But right, <laughs> go ahead. What were you saying? Making a uh, just uh, you know, just basically, you know, have you uh, you know, for, based off of your diet, have you kind of gotten your blood markers, you know, tested to see like if you have X amount of antioxidants and th- these different things that you're talking about, or well, even in people that you work with. Yeah, well, keep in mind when people come in to see me as a patient, I see thousands of patients, you know, or have through the last. Um, 30 years, I have 10,000 family charts in my, in my practice, so I'm not seeing patients much right now. But um, So yeah, they come in and I, I have a machine that scores their antioxidants and right on the, with, their, with the laser on their hands, and we can see right away that these people have low level of antioxidants mm-hmm. in tissues. You could see that, and then people follow my dietary program, their antioxidant score in their tissues will go up by four to five fold, you know what I mean? And it takes months to get them up there. So if I'm going to take you off your, if I'm going to wean you down slowly off your drugs for your psoriasis or for arthritis, I'm going to wait three to six months and start to slowly take you down. Mm. So you make to your nutrient levels are higher in your tissues first. So your immune system has more chance of being fixed. I'm not going to have you come in and start taking out these really d- dangerous drugs right away, right away. So yes, I can measure antioxidants in their tissues. And the studies also that show that lutein levels are an incredible predictor of heart attack risk and, and dementia risk um, because lutein is the carotenoid that gives the green vegetables green and carotenoid makes the orange vegetables orange and lycopene makes the red vegetables red. By testing lutein, it's not, the, it's not causing your blood vessels to be elastic and protecting them from heart attacks, but it's a marker for how many green vegetables you ate. And green vegetables are most protective against, um, against the, losing the elasticity of your blood vessels and having endothelial inflammation that leads to cholesterol deposition in your blood vessel walls. So what I'm saying right now is that green vegetables are per- tremendously protective, and if you don't eat a lot of green vegetables in your diet, then you better live close to a hospital. What are some of the uh, mm. the, the foods that we should be avoiding? I, I heard you mention uh, oil uh, today and then also in some other talks that you've done. Uh, are, all, you know, are all oils bad for us? Well, we we're talking here about excess calories being bad for us. Americans are eating about 500 calories from oil a day. If you're working behind a plow eight hours a day carrying a heavy plow with an ox, maybe you're, if you're a physical laborer chopping down trees and digging ditches all day, you can have a little bit extra empty calories. But for most of us having desk jobs, those extra calories turn into fat pretty quickly. Mm. Let me ask you a question then. We know that these lignans and sesame seeds and flax seeds and chia seeds pretend tremendous to protect against cancer. And we know there's a sterols and stanols that protect against prostate and breast cancer. So when you take the oil out of the sesame seed, or the, when you take the oil out of the walnut, you know the walnut is anti-beneficial. So what do you think, just a guess, would be healthier? Walnuts or walnut oil? Sesame seeds or sesame oil? Flax seeds or flaxseed oil? Olives or olive oil? So what do you think, by a guess, which would make people live longer? And what do you think the studies show as to which foods are more protective, the oil or the whole natural nut or seed? Let me ask you a question, what you think would be better? Yeah, probably the uh, nut or the seed, just like uh, orange or orange juice, right? Exactly. So now it's a question of we can't just willy-nilly pour calories over our food. We have to not eat excess calories. So if there's a choice between a walnut or walnut oil or sesame seeds or sesame oil, what do you think links to longer health? Obviously, we want to eat foods that have nutrients and fiber in them. You know, if I gave you a tablespoon of olive oil to eat before you went to lunch, you wouldn't eat 120 calories less. Right. You would eat the same amount of calories because <laughs> right. it's like no fiber. doesn't feel anything. doesn't yeah. feel anything. But if I gave you an apple with 65 calories, you'd eat 65 calories less because of the weight, the fiber, the nutrients, suppress the appetite by 65 calories. Not only that, if I gave you 100 calories of nuts and seeds, the sterols and stanols and fibers, those factors that suck, that hold onto fat like a magnet in nuts and seeds, carry fat out into the stool. And when they do so, they actually attract fat from the other side of the villi. They attract fat from the blood vessels in your bloodstream. So they suck saturated fat and oxidized LDL out into the toilet bowl. So when you, your appetite was ratcheted down by 100 calories, but you only got 70 calories in. So it naturally suppressed the appetite. If you put the oil on the food, it increased the appetite. Because now, because oil is an appetite stimulator. Because it's rushed us into the bloodstream so rapidly that it signals dopamine in the brain like cocaine does. So what I'm saying right now is that fast food 
includes oil and sugar and honey and maple syrup because they enter the bloodstream a huge amount at one time, like a bolus. When you eat nuts and seeds as your source of fat, or you eat berries or, you know, or mangoes as your source of sugar, the bloodstream, the, sh the sugar and the fat enter the bloodstream very slowly, and you don't get the dopamine stimulation in the brain to make you want to overeat food. So yes, I'm saying, let's make salad dressings with the whole nut or seed. One of my favorite salad dressings might be tomato sauce or tomato paste with almonds and sunflower seeds and, and blood orange vinegar. I mean, excuse me, or, or balsamic vinegar or black fig vinegar with a few raisins in there. So, um, or it might be an orange peeled with some blood orange vinegar and some lemon and some cashew nuts and sesame seeds. And I'm trying to make sauces or a Thai dressing made with hemp seeds and peanuts and lemongrass and cumin and, and a date. You know, so I'm trying to make dressings and sauces that are made from natural foods and not from oil, sugar, and salt, right? Avoiding sugar, salt, and oil. And we're giving people, we're not taking the fat out of our diet. We're just getting the fat from a whole food instead of a processed food. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the modification to a person's health are incredible because we see in, from the studies that nuts and seeds, in all the major studies, you know, in the physician's health study, men who ate nuts and seeds three more times a week had a 60% lower risk of sudden cardiac death. In the meta-analysis in nuts and seeds with more than 350,000 individuals, it showed that overall in the higher consumer of nuts and seeds to one serving a day, had a 39% lower rate of cardiovascular death. More nuts and seeds, less death. Less nuts and seeds, more oil, more death. The PrevMed study showed the same thing. Olive oil versus butter. It showed people switched from olive oil to butter, 10% reduction in cardiovascular death. Switched to nuts and seeds from olive oil, 60% reduction in cardiovascular death. In other words, because something's better than something else doesn't make it perfect. So we're trying to give people what's best, not what's not, you know, just because a Mediterranean diet is better than an American diet, but a nutritarian diet is tweaked. So you're not just reducing heart attack risk, you're wiping it out completely. We're really giving people the information they need to take charge of their health destiny. And to, if they, don't, if they want to be really healthy, they can be and not make these little nutritional mistakes that can mess up their health. Like, like thinking oil is healthful and pouring oil over your, your foods. I always say that the biggest scam ever perpetrated on the world's population and the biggest marketing scam, it so shows how, what, how good marketing can re and good, a lot of money can do to convince people that oil is a health food. And now everybody's pouring, thinking olive oil is health food and coconut oil is healthy. And, you know, they just think oil is healthy. God, it's like scam people, you know? Yeah, and, and I think the main problem there is people just aren't really thinking about it. You know, they're just, they're not, they're not, they'd have no idea that they just added 30 grams of fat. They added a huge amount of calories. Yeah. You know, and, and people believe what they feel like they want to eat. They like to hear good news about the habits, they, the bad habits they have. They want, to look, they want to be supportive. They want a person to get out here on the microphone with you and tell them it's okay to eat whatever they want to eat. That's, they don't, they don't, some people aren't going to like my message, right? Because I'm really, I'm hard-nosed on them. I'm saying you've got to eat healthy if you want to be healthy. And a healthier diet is healthier than a diet that's not as healthy. They don't like that. When it comes to like the high, because you mentioned working with professional athletes, right? And yeah. you have to rack up some of their protein needs. Right. Um, what do some of those foods look like for them? And I mean, would you have a guideline for like um, kilogram per pound of how much per, like how much of, of an individual, of what they weigh versus like the activity they do? Or is it just like, do you not really worry about that? I don't particularly worry about it. Like any diet, any, if a, a nutritarian diet gives you about 40, um, grams of protein per thousand calories, let's say. Right? Okay. Now, if you're bigger and more exercising more, you need more calories anyway. So if, I might, if I'm in competition athlete, I'm eating 4,000 calories a day. I even could be, so I'm getting, four, four, I'm getting you know, um, 160 grams of protein a day because I have a higher calorie need. You know what I mean? But, but I still, with my athletes, I'm still giving them more hemp seeds, more edamame, more Mediterranean pine nuts, not regular pine nuts, because they're thirty-three percent protein versus thirteen percent protein in a regular pine nut. I'm giving them, you know, I'm still giving them more, you know, pea protein and more. I'm giving them more, um, paying attention to more of the higher protein vegetables, um, and beans and nuts and seeds. There's differences from the nut and seed can be ten percent protein versus thirty-five percent protein. I'm giving, I'm purposely designing it to be a little more, um, you know, perfect, perfect for their athletic needs, so they don't have to go onto the animal products to get all that extra protein. I want to give as much plant protein as they can so they can be more moderate or lower their animal product intake. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, so with athletes, I want them to reduce their animal protein and eat more plant protein because we're saying it prolongs their career. You're mentioning a wide variety of foods. Is this something that we tr need to try to get in every day 
or is it more like just you know try to get it in the best you can like the between the the beans and the um and the green vegetables and the every onions day. and stuff every day trying to get some some in some dosage of it every day That's treating right. it like a like a medication or a supplement almost absolutely i want people to eat a salad every single day and the salads have a nut and seed dressing on it i want people to have the hemp seeds and flax seeds every single day I want them to have some mushrooms cooked in their soup or in their, in their vegetable dish every single day. I want them to have the cook green, some vegetables every day and some beans every day and I want, or, or soybeans. And I want, so they're having seeds and nuts and greens and some onions and mushrooms every, and, and fruits and berries every single day. You ever rec- recommend blending these things up or does that change the whole composition of it just as we talked about with oil and uh... A lot of them, like a lot of people, especially the athletes, do the smoothies they carry. Just around. out of pure convenience. Well, no, also because they can get more into themselves without right. getting full, too. And they, they look in there, so they need so much. You know, I was one of those athletes who had to get a lot of calories in because I eat some exercising all day long. It's my job to exercise, mm. you know what I mean? So I had to get some more. So I, if I was chewing all day to get all those greens in, I couldn't, I was wasting, I couldn't have enough time to do all the chewing. And I was too busy with trying to go to school and compete and, and, <laughs> and train all day long. So, but this, so I, you know, I'm it's still. We feel your pain over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, yes, yeah, so I could, I, you know, some meals you don't want. So, the green vegetables, for example, have an enzyme called myrosinase in the cell wall. And you have to chew or break it open that enzyme for the myrosinase enzyme to catalyze the production of the ITCs that prevent cancer. So, if you swallow a salad quickly and you don't chew it very well, you're not going to get all the anti cancer benefits. So you have to really concentrate on chewing the salad well, and I don't have time to really chew every salad that well. So I want to blend it in the blender and just suck it down so I can go quickly and quickly go back to training and do what I have to do, and then I could chew the salad later on at night. So yeah, I, I use smoothies, with a lot, especially with athletes. That's why some of these pros are carrying around those blenders with them. They can put the flax seeds and the, in the, in the um, Mediterranean pine nuts, and, the, and they can put it in the blender with some wild blueberries, and so they could put in some, some greens and, and bok kale, and they could just whip it all up and have it and take it as a smoothie with them. You know what I mean? What about uh, dairy? Does dairy fit into your plans at all? Well, I'm trying to people to recognize that I want their animal product consumption to be below 10% of total calories. So it modulates IGF-1 below, you know, around uh, below 175, let's say. So one, I want IGF-1 to run between, let's say, 100 and 175. The average American is 250. Mm. I don't want them. So in dairy products, raise IGF-1 a lot. And they, so they're, they're designed for a cow to, let's say, triple its weight in the first mm. month of life. And they're, they're too growth promoting, you know. So we don't want growth promotion because growth promotion can promote cancer growth promotion. And so, I, so I do. I want them to restrict dairy. But if they're having something like a yogurt or something, that counts towards their animal product intake. Right. You know, you know if they want to eat some you know, scallops or salmon, that they can't have the dairy then. They, so if they're adding just a small amount to what they're doing, then they got to take they got to take it out. Is fermented food important, or because we're eating such a variety of vegetables, we're getting the uh, fermentation anyway? That's correct. It's not important because you're already getting the the, the the four the two raw foods. You're naturally fermenting vegetables, correct? Like you, in your stomach, right? Yes, exactly. The two the, you build up a thick and favorable microbiome from the um, from those four foods we're talking about. The four foods are two raw raw green vegetables and raw onion scallion, and the two cooked foods are beans and and mushrooms. That combination of those four foods gives you a very favorable microbiome buildup of the beneficial bacteria. So you don't need to have the probiotic or fermented foods that are to take the probiotics usually. You know, take antibiotics you do or something. But even the probiotics people take or the fermented foods they take don't take a permanent, um, live, don't live permanently in the lining of the digestive tract. When you eat these foods regularly, you get much more adherence to the microbe, to the villi, and they're more stable. The microbiome becomes more stable. And that's one of the main problems with a high meat diet. One of the main problems is the production of gram negative bacteria and, and eating foods that are high in choline, like eggs and, and meat and even fish can then predote the production of bacteria that produce unfavorable compounds like TMAO or trimethylamine oxide, which inflames the blood vessels and increases risk of dementia. So we can't, you know, so that's one of the drawbacks is we're trying to create a good microbiome with all these vegetables and fibers. Yeah, we just had Dr. Andy Galpin on uh, recently, and he talked about, you know, having a variety of food so that you do build up a, mi- a gut microbiome that is resilient and can handle uh, various foods. And sometimes when people go on these elimination diets, they start to get rid of uh, a lot of foods and they start to only eat something like meat. Uh, as soon as they go to bring something else back into their diet, you know, their stomach blows up and they're not used to it and they, they end up getting irritated and stuff like that. So he, you know, he shared some of uh, 
some of what you're saying. And I'm glad you're bringing up beans because as soon as the show's over, I'm excited. I'm going to go out and get a big can of pork and beans. I'm messing with you. <laughs> The sugar in there. Yeah, I know, I know. And pork, I know, I know. I mess with it. Yeah, but the por- the sugar's worse than the pork. I'm sure it is, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's probably through the roof. Uh, did you hear about the, uh, I'm going to butcher her name, but it's, uh, I think, Joanna Mendoza. She was a, a 28-year-old vegan that kind of got outed because she got caught eating fish. Um, she ended up having to, like, reveal, like, a whole long, sad story about how she wasn't having her menstrual cycle uh, she was having all kinds of weird issues, so she had to get off of the diet, and so she had to start incorporating uh, fish, um, eggs, and any kind of animal protein based from her doctor telling her that. Uh, I'm not sure if you're you familiar with that at all. Well, I'm not familiar with that one case, that exact but, one I'm, case. but I'm familiar with thousands of people on the internet who claim they do better with animal products in their diet. Mm-hmm. That is not surprising. Um, so, you know... Also, but also, you already mentioned that a vegan diet. We already uh, talked about that. That's not that's not supplemented. Uh, might be a mistake as well, right? A vegan diet is not some. A lot of these low fat vegans are advocating people not take DHA and co- creating a risk of dementia in later life. And a lot of them are like people even not eating nuts and seeds, putting solo in fat that can actually be negative for their long term health. So there's some there's some very dangerous there's ad, there's vegan gurus that are giving potentially dangerous information with brain shrinkage and increased risk of depression. Mm -hmm. That some people need more cholesterol even than a vegan diet can supply that could lead to their depression. Um, I'm also recognizing that we have individual differences and some people need need some some more saturated fat than others. I'm not um, denying the differences among individuals that require some people to eat some animal products for to be healthy for them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, nor am I denying that people that there are bad vegan diets too, you know? But we have to put it in context of the, what we know in the scientific world that we have to, if we need to use animal products, we have to try to use it moderately, recognizing that plant heavy diets are much more lifespan promoting. Gotcha. And even if an individual needs that to have that in their diet, they should minimize the use of those foods, not maximize the use of those foods like a paleo or ketogenic diet. Mm-hmm. And then I wouldn't do the, uh, the listeners any justice, but do you have anything against bagels? Because you've now compared it to meat and saying that bagels are bad. They just love the fact that you have been putting bagels down bad this whole time. <laughs> I'm, I say, I'm saying bagels are worse than, anim, than animal products. Wow. Worse. Uh-huh. Um, I do compare bagels to meat because they both are sources of calories with not a significant load of antioxidants and phytochemicals. However, mm-hmm. if you look at most of the data, people cutting back on fat and meat intake and increasing more of the carbohydrate intake from white rice and sugar and white flour, their disease gets worse even than they were on the meat. That doesn't exonerate meat just because white flour is worse. They're just because if you'd use beans instead of the white flour, they would be better than the meat instead of the white flour. Mm-hmm. But but people don't recognize that when they eat bagels and they're eating a cancer promoting food. Mm-hmm. They're eating a heart disease promoting food just because this, they think of it being benign. It's not high in fat, but it's not benign. It's a seriously damaging stuff. And the more you eat these empty calorie, high glycemic carbohydrates, processed carbohydrates, you're shortening your life in proportion to your using it, utilization of them. Do we have some wiggle room with our diet, like uh, in, in your, in what you uh, promote? Obviously, it's going to matter. Like if we've talked about people that are obese, maybe you don't give them a cheat meal because it might set them back. Right. But what about people that you have gotten to be a little bit healthy? Can they go out and enjoy themselves and have like a pizza or something here and there, or you don't advocate that? Well, you know, I don't really do that myself. You know, you know, more than a couple times a year. I don't think I have. I like stay. I don't prefer those foods because I get once you get used to eating this way. You like like it better, and you like the way you feel. You know, it's like, just imagine if I went to I had a, like a Chinese restaurant, had a high salt meal. You know, I'd be drinking water all night long, unable <laughs> to sleep. I'm not used to eating that food. And then I then you know if I went and had a conventional ice cream, I could taste the bleach in it and the chemicals in it. I love my ice cream made with the macadamia nuts and the bananas and the real vanilla bean powder. I don't want that fake vanilla bean extract stuff. It tastes like chemicals to me. Mm. I like my healthy version of my chocolate. I want a chocolate bean brownie. I want my, I want my own custard made with avocado and, you know, and cocoa powder and dates. I don't want this junk food stuff. I want the real stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I want the natural stuff. It tastes better in you than intellectually you feel better about eating it. So even though that stuff might taste good sometimes, the nutritarian version made of natural foods tastes in many cases, better, and you get, and then emotionally, you're more attached to it because you know it's good for you too. You know, so I don't need to have that stuff. But the answer to your question is, it depends on how often, because let me, because what would you think, that because commercial french fries are fried in oil, 
that's been cooked all day long in a vat where it causes can- carcinogenic compounds. It's like not like putting... So one serving a week of commercial fast food French fries was shown to increase risk of breast cancer by 26%. Yeah. That's just one serving a week. Now, people aren't eating one serving a week. There are people eating French fries every single They're eating junk food and fast food every single day, and then they, compl- they get cancer or get demented or have some tragedy happens to them. So we have to be careful, and we all have genetic weaknesses. And the other issue to consider is most people adopting my recommendations didn't start this from birth. They've destroyed their health for the first 50 years of their life. And they've got methylation defects, and they've got a buildup of metabolic waste products. They've got DNA cross-linking damage, and if left unchecked, they're going to get cancer or some problem's going to happen to them. And I want them to recognize that if they're going to really get the benefits that I'm claiming they can get and not have cancer, they've got to really do this, you know, seriously. They can't play around with it and dabble in it because they've already caused some damage there. And there are many people coming to me to reverse disease. But you're right. If you were, like, eating perfectly since birth, then later on in life, you could probably have more cheats without it causing problems. Mm-hmm. But because people are eating so, such a bad diet, they can't afford to cheat so much when they get older. You know what I mean? What you, do you, what, oh, go ahead. You know, you pro- after literally what you just said, you probably won't like what I'm about to ask you. But a lot of okay. listeners are listening in. Probably they eat meat. Some of them are healthy, maybe some of them not so much. And they're right. wondering, maybe while eating moderate amount of protein because I like eating meat, right? What can I do and, or add in from your diet to help my potential longevity? Like, could I... And you'll probably say you need to lower your intake of meat or not eat meat at all. But they'll probably eat meat. Could they add in maybe your the what you've talked about in terms of G-bombs into their diet to be more be- beneficial? Yes. People are probably wondering how can I balance this in without just totally going one way. Well, I was on live with Kelly and Michael. Yeah. You know, and Michael Strahan said to me, not give me that, that vegetable burger. I'm not eating that. I want a meat burger. So I said, Michael, taste this burger. I made it with mushrooms and onions. And like, and, and I put some, and there's some, there's only an ounce of meat in there, but it's an eight ounce burger with an ounce of meat. But he, and there was some, I don't know what else was in there, mushrooms or almond butter or whatever it is. He takes this burger out of the oven where I hit himself, I hit him with a mitt, you know, over his head. And you know, he was fighting with a mitt. Like, who's going to pull it out you of the oven jump, first? right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Big guy. So anyway, so, um, so he tastes it. He says, this is the best burger I ever ate. It's like incredible. How'd you make this thing? I said, yeah, I made it for you, Michael. I knew you would like, you had to have some meat in your burger. I said, put a little bit of meat in it. It still tastes great. You know, it sucked up the flavor. You don't have to... So I'm showing them how they can use animal products as a condiment to flavor things. And like you just, you, you thought you came to something right now because one of the dangers of too much meat, red meat particularly, is the heme iron That's, that increases inflammation in the body. But when you eat beans with meat, like you make a chili, or a burger, you just put a bean, you put a little bit of meat in there, and the, and the lectins in the beans bind the iron and prevent you to absorb so much of the heme iron, which makes it less dangerous. Some of the damaging effects of meat are bound up by some of the effects of the be- vegetables and the beans. So yes, you, if you're going to eat animal products, you eat it in very small, you eat small amounts and use it as a condiment, and you can use it as a flavoring because some of these flavors sucks it up, and you don't need much to get the flavor out of it. But even if we just were to start to eat more of what you're recommending, that may help as well. You're going you're gonna to feel satisfied with less animal products the more you do this. And especially- Sounds scary. I got, I, <laughs> I got incredibly great recipes that are going to shock you. Very creative and very delicious. You know, yeah. You're going to feel very satisfied. And, feel, and you're going to feel better because you know why? You get better in muscular endurance. That's the best thing. You're not going to get stronger, but you get better endurance. You can keep going. Well, I can go to. I can go skiing and like jump down moguls the whole day. Practically, you know what I mean. Um, um, you're, you're one of the few people that we've had on the show. We we have some people that do it here and there. They'll they'll speak in absolutes. But I gotta say, you're probably out of all the guests that we've had, you speak very directly. Like this is going to help this way. Hmm. Um, how have you cut, come to those conclusions? Has it been you know because you've been doing this for so long, work with so many people, and and bef- and previously. You know, were you making some mistakes in the beginning? Were you maybe recommending too much meat or recommending uh, too much of one particular food? Yes. I mean, it's a combination of not just having seen a lot of people who are like, let's say I'm seeing people that, a lot of from the vegan community who have adopted this way of eating to reverse their heart disease or live or get well and lose weight, and they develop problems because their diet maybe didn't have enough DHA or iodine or zinc in it, and I'm taking their blood work and looking where they messed up. You know what I mean? So being more careful and making sure they're getting the comprehensive exposure to nutrients they would have gotten had they had some animal products in their diet. You know, so it's, but that's where I've learned a lot, is seeing people who are, who are mis- maybe um, not doing that well or thriving on their vegan diet to see what they did wrong. We already know people with a lot of meat diets have heart disease and can't die, you know, but so, so, I mean, so it's really uh, perfecting everything. And yeah, I mean... It's, um, 
over the years, you become a better artist at being able to really enable people to do this and be compliant with it, because there's an art to be a motivator and you know, to be able to motivate people to really make the change and then to make it fun and tasty for them. And I think I've become... So when I started doing this, maybe the percent of people that came to me would not do what I told them to do. But now they come to me, and I'm better at, at, make, at having them remove the obstacles that were impeding their ability to do this, whether it's taste or change in mental attitude or knowledge, whatever it was. But I'm, I've got much better chance of success with my patients. Are there particular types of beans? Because there seems like there's kind of a lot of different types of beans. And do you prefer for people to soak them? And there's a lot of different ways to prepare them. Yes, they should soak them overnight and then mix them up, mush them up, up their hand, and then pour the water off and put fresh water in to cook them. And, you know, people underestimate, because there's all this nonsense on the internet about soybeans being, and soy products being dangerous and causing, and they're really one of the most protective against cancer, and especially hormonally sensitive cancers. But I'm talking about real soybeans, not soy, not tofu, not soy milk, not isolated soy protein, not fake soy foods. We're talking about real whole soybeans you can cook into a soup. You can put the dried soybeans, soak them overnight, and put reconstant them in your soup. Those are very powerfully against cancer and very powerfully beneficial for athletes and very powerful for your for overall health to make the dried soybeans with other beans, like azuki beans and lentils, and put it into a soup, cabbage, and make it be sweet and sour and make it taste delicious, and, you know. But it's, it's underestimated as a real cancer longe longevity, protective, and athletically positive food. Do you have children? I have four. Oh, cool. And uh, how have they have adopted uh, into some of this uh, style of eating, and especially like, you know, as they were growing up with you making your uh, changes in your nutrition? You know, it's funny because my kids were always completely shocked by the way that people ate. They like they were flabbergasted by it. They used to say to me, like when my daughter Kara, who was twenty five this week, she was my youngest daughter. I have three daughters, and a son who's now my son is seventeen, so he's the youngest child. But my Kara is my youngest daughter. When she was Four, she was exercising at a gym with me. They had a, a kid's boot camp, which she called a boo-boo boo camp. <laughs> so she'd come out of her, her exercise class, and she says to me, don't these parents love their children? This is a four-year-old. And I go, well, yeah, of course they love their children. What are you talking about? She says, um, well, they're eating like cheese doodles and candy, and they're supposed to be here for health reasons. And don't they know what they, what they eat makes who they are and makes their body? And I said, Kara, they don't know what we know. They don't know that what you put in your mouth makes who you are and makes your body healthy. And she says, how could they be so stupid? You know, <laughs> how could they not know that? And I said, well, it's just because everybody's doing it. They, don't, they just don't think because that's the way people are. You know, so my kids had this problem of like, why were people so stupid putting poisons in their body? You know, they, they, just, they couldn't figure it out. It's not any different than kind of telling your kid, hey, you know, go play in traffic and see what happens. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's a roll of the dice, right? I had to convince my kids that if everybody was smoking cigarettes, all the kids were smoking on the playground and all the parents were smoking, you would think smoking was normal. So you go to a basketball game or a social activity or a, or a school choir or, a, um, or a playing soccer, the, pa the parents bring you donut holes and give the kids cheese doodles, and they're saying, why does it just give them cocaine and whiskey, and what are they doing here? Giving these kids, <laughs> they're supposed to be having, having a healthy activity here, and they're trying to give poison to kids now. My kids were saying, what's going you know, they were fr It was always frustrating. Why are they hurting the kids? So this is my, why are they hurting the kids? You know, why do people, parents want to hurt kids with own kids? It's like they, it was really kind of, I remember when my son, Sean, went to a, he went to see his sisters in a choir in elementary school. He never had eaten a chocolate chip cookie before. He never eat cookie. So we walk in and right at his mouth level is this table where, the, where there's somebody from the school PTA handing out cookies to kids as they walk in the door. So he takes this cookie and he, I don't know, remember if he was five or whatever he was, and he looks at it. He'd never seen a cookie before. <laughs> He looks at it, he smells it, and we're like looking at him like a scientific experiment, my <laughs> wife and I. We're saying, what is he going to do with this cookie? I don't think he recognizes it as being food. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, and I didn't know how much he knows, you know. So, so he tastes a little nibble of it, and he goes, <laughs> He goes, yuck, that's junk food, and he throws it back at the woman. <laughs> he throws it at her. <laughs> So their normal was way different than everybody else's. Huh? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. And uh, do they still kind of uh, eat similar? Uh, no, they're all drug addicts now. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> no, they're, they're, um, they love eating this way. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Not bad. And then uh, do you got other family members, you know, in on the diet as well? Or, you know, like, because, you know, I go to like family functions and, you know, I get, 
asked a lot yeah. of questions about nutrition and stuff. And mm. it's just always kind of, you know, it always baffles me. I'm like, I'm sitting right here. I could help you, you know, with your exercise and nutrition. Uh, are you able to help a lot of your family members as well? Well, I'll give you a couple of stories. One of one of my, um, my sister-in-law never, you know, always thought that she, that she knew better and, you know, and not going to follow what I tell her to do. She's fine drinking her wine and her, her chicken marinara, whatever it is, okay. you know, until she got breast cancer. Mm. Then after she had invasive breast cancer and given not too much time to live, then she, then we helped her and told her what she had to do. And then she did it. And now she's fine. She got rid of her cancer and she, time she had her cancer removed, that was premenopausal breast cancer, mm. early in life breast cancer, very aggressive and kills people. So she did have chemo. But the time they took the, her breasts off, there was they couldn't find any tumor, and now she, this is you know decade later, and she's fine. And she if it was her diet; yeah. she'd never be doing great and being healthy today. My father-in-law had a heart attack. He wasn't going to listen to me either. Yeah. But after his heart attack, he had low ejection fraction, and then was didn't have you know. But now these changes diet, and when it come around, now his ejection fraction, his heart got fixed, and his ejection fraction is back to normal. And things that happened to him, he would never be alive today. So these family members of mine that maybe did not listen to me when I was younger. If they hadn't changed after something bad happened to them, they wouldn't be slipping today. They'd be dead by now. Mm. But they're still alive, doing okay. So I'd like people to make the change before they have something terrible tragedy happen to them, not wait that long, you know. But many people are stubborn and it's coming, you know, and, and, and they're indoctrinated in the American way of thinking and they're brainwashed with bad information. They like to believe things that tell them they can eat the things they want to eat, but it's going to be tough at times. But now, luckily, I could say, um, all my family and my wife's family are now eating this way. Um, you grew up in uh, Yonkers, New York, right? Yeah, I didn't know that. What are you following me around? Yeah, yeah, we got we got we got information on you. Um, <laughs> Lots of bagels in New York, right? <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> unconventional to be a figure skater. Let's just say, right? Uh, that must have been like a hard a hard thing to maybe get into, or a hard thing to do without. Like, I'm sure you got teased and stuff like that, right? Um, figure skating, like being from such a tough uh, city. I don't think I don't remember really. No, it wasn't um, really a thing. Nah, you know, I could take care of myself. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and sure, there were there were um, maybe a higher percentage of gay athletes in some sport like figure skating, but that was still a minority. Right. You know, um, and regardless. Um, I'm just thinking Yonkers. I mean, that's like yeah. that's the uh, the home home of the Yankees, and you yeah. know, like just kind of a, a tough city to grow up in. So, sure. well, we took martial arts, and we knew how to fight and stuff. You know, I, it wasn't. A, I don't think we got too much um, problems. It's funny because in those days, kids nowadays don't fight and don't do that kind of stuff. Now we everybody has to be socially, you know. But in those days, we would, you know, we were when I was a kid because I'm 65. You know, um, people got more got into more fights. Yeah, you you know? prove yourself, and yeah, then they leave you alone. Yeah. People, would, <laughs> somebody would grab you onto you and, like, try to pull your underwear up in the locker room, <laughs> right. and you'd have to be able to know how to take care of yourself. Right, you know? right. <laughs> you know. How did you learn how to figure skate? Well, to just, uh, you know, because in New York it's very cold, and there's, you know, plenty of plenty of areas to skate at, or did you, like, learn there was like, a ring indoor close, There was a ring close to my house. Yeah. There, that's what got us started, a ring right down the road from where we lived. Um, and then I just... Um, liked it and my and saw success, you know. So it was a good sport and and kind of like loved the thrill of going fast and like going into the air and flying through the air. Just as a very good, you know, had a lot of nice things in that sport. That yeah, you must have spent a tremendous amount of time doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. It's coming I mean, it becomes addicting because you really and being doing it, being competitive sports becomes addicting. You know what I mean? You like you you get fed into it and you just want to keep going and your whole reason for living becomes success in, success in your sport. Maybe you become a little too fanatical about it, you know yeah. what I mean? And the sport becomes can become, so, you know, it's pros and cons. Um, and then was it hard to transition from, from that sport, you know, when you got injured and stuff like that? Was that it must have been kind of hard, right? It was. I was, like, um, semi-depressed for, like, maybe a few years after losing, getting hurt and unable to be in the 76 Olympics. I had, yeah, you know, so it's it, hard to figure out after you, yeah, if you have uh, such an injury like that. Yeah, if you're ra especially if you was ranked num number one in the country in 1974, and then I'm missing 76 Olympics with an injury, it was kind of disappointing. But then, of course, I would have probably never been a doctor if that happened if I didn't have that happen to me. And uh, and over the years, I realize, look back, and I say, you know, that's really not that trying to be, um, you know, you can be happier. Um, getting being able to have more pleasure from life and be a more rounded existence. Mm. 
and being able to have a good effect on other people and being able to appreciate the structure of the world and appreciate the value in others and help them. It's, just, it's not just about trying to be the best in something and feeling, and feeling that reward from being some su your own personal success is much more minor um, aspect and maybe even not even good for your emotional health as much as really trying to be a good person. So I think that maybe, my, that maybe getting hurt might have helped me. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions, you guys? Do you think that, um, like, when you were skating, you said that you were really engulfed in that and trying to, like, become the best at that. And then yeah. with that injury, you you moved towards this. Now, how, like, because I know you still keep super active now. You're obviously in good shape. What do you feel that, like, what has brought you the most meaning and purpose in terms of what you do? Like, what, what is that for you? Well, I really do think that my career has been a tremendous blessing for me. When I went back to, to go to medical school or take the postgraduate pre-med program at Columbia or whatever it was, to, I never thought I would have had the opportunity I've had today to have a positive effect on so many people. You know, having, um, being on television with my own show on PBS and all these things where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have bought my packages, have read my books and have sent me mail letters I would change their life. I just thought I'd be happy treating people across my desk when in a medical office trying to help some people. I never thought I'd be able to help hundreds of thousands of people get healthier, you know, or have the opportunity to do this podcast today and reach out, out to the community to help people make a better, have a healthier life. I'm, I'm, all, I'm always um, still never, it never becomes boring to me. It's always thrilling. It's always a tremendous feeling of um, personal satisfaction from being able to see a person improve their health and get better and have this. Um, so I'm very grateful for the opportunities I've had. You know what I mean? You're never seeking to retire. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm maybe going to work a little less, but not looking to get, not looking <laughs> to, you know, totally retire. Maybe not, maybe not work, you know, 16 hour days, but I'm still, obviously, I love what I do. It's amazing. Cool. Have, uh, have you ever heard the, it's, because you brought up a couple sports references, but the, uh, like the saying, playing not to lose? Playing not to lose. Yeah, like usually when a team gets ahead, they yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, first right. half, second half, they just start playing so, all defense and they don't actually try to thrive or do anything else. Right. So a lot of the um, our listeners, a lot of fans of Mark, we're, we're all performance-based, right? We want to do more. So uh, when someone hears you saying, like, you know, maintain your body weight and stay there for longevity, um, they hear that as like, okay, so I'm just going to be skinny. I'm going to be weak for the rest of my life. I'm not actually going to live. I'm just going to strive for longevity is there any chance of like a happy medium where i don't know you can incorporate like uh some form of like gaining size while still maintaining like a good health like you know what i mean like you want to have an arm wrestle <laughs> I, I'm, I'm definitely down we have a, a, a table, table right out here okay. yeah <laughs> and that's not because i have experience we just actually have one out here <laughs> <laughs> this thing is it's not a question of these things right you know i mean we want people to be as fit and healthy as possible and as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. So what's, what are your goals? I mean, are your goals to get us gain weight and be, look better in, in the mirror? Or are your goals to try to live longer? I don't care. If that's up to you. That's a, you know, if you want to sacrifice some life to be a little bigger, go right for it. That's your, it's your right. It's a free mm -hmm. world. And I personally would rather um, be fit and strong. Don't forget, I'm pretty strong for my size. You know, look at a wrestler who wants to get to keep their weight below 150 pounds and be really strong. What about the people who are, who are boxers trying to feed, trying to keep their weight below 150 and still be truly fit? You know, we're, 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 I'm advocating people be fit for their body weight and be, and I strive to be that, have the fitness of a professional athlete. I'm 65 years old with a body fat below 10%. And I've got a I've got a six packed stomach, you know, and I can do, you know, I just showed them I could do V ups and I can lift my legs up to all the way up to the top while I'm hanging them from my arms, right? Just so I'm, what I'm saying is I want people to be super fit. And I great I'm speaking to this audience that wants to be super fit. But why can't you marry together great fitness and great physical accomplishment with great health too? You wanna not do that? Go do whatever you want. You know, I'm just giving you the facts. You can do what you want with it. Well said. Uh, what do you do for exercise? I know you mentioned uh, skiing. It looks like you hit the gym and stuff. What, what do you do for exercise? A variety, you know, because I mix it up. Some days I go to the gym. Sounds like your diet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some days I go for a bike ride. Some days I go for a jog, a run. Some days I'm going skiing, and some and some days I'm playing singles tennis. Some days I'm running in the sand and, you know, back and forth on a volleyball court. Sometimes I'm doing um, a calisthenics just in place, you know what I mean? I'm, I just vary it up. I just have to do what I feel like doing. 
and I and I know if I I know if I do something one day, I'm going to do something different. Because I went skiing last week, this week, and I killed myself at um, an aspen on, <laughs> last. I, I skied the whole day till I was like wiped. <laughs> so I'm not going to do my legs today for a couple of days. I'm going to do my arm and my stomach and my back. You know what I mean? I'll do something else. D- did sense. you mention skating or no? I don't skate anymore. I'm I'm curious. Do you not skate because like it's something you used to do at a really high level and it would yeah. just bring back that you know that, i can't that. do what i used to do on the ice yeah and i and it's probably not even safe to try what i used to do <laughs> <laughs> and just skating around you know is kind of boring yeah i can't like do but on skis i can do a lot of stuff because i can fit in this i injured my heel when i was young as you know okay and i my heel is not quite normal so i can't really take a huge impact on the ice and come down really hard on it so i can't i don't want to jump high and come back on the ice but on a ski boot I can go over a jump. I can do a, a 360 off a mogul. I can come down because in the ski boot, there's more room for padding under my heel. Yeah. So I, I can take impact without damaging my, my back and my foot bottoming mm. out. You know what I mean? Mm. So I, I can feel more confident in skis and try things and, and be more aggressive. And I can still get a great workout. And I much enjoy that, the thrill of that because I you know, was raised on the, you know what I mean? It's a different thing. Yeah. And I, and I, so I do a lot of different things. You know? okay. uh, tell us about the book that you're writing right now, if you can. Well, the book that I'm working on now is called The Nutritarian Diet, and it's, um, it kind of encompasses a lot of my career and a lot of the most recent advances in nutritional science, so it's not just here to lose weight, but also slow aging and really keep your, have your play span. And keep, so we're talk, a lot of what we talked about today was a lot of information that I've, that's in this new book, you know, about CERT1 proteins and AMP kinase and caloric restriction and, and phytochemicals, all this stuff's in this new book coming out, you know. Um, so it's really fun stuff, and I think that, you know, I think where society is moving there's a lot of people really into this stuff today. Oh, yeah. They really want this information. They want the science, yeah. yeah. Well, they want the science. And my books are super heavy in science. They, you know, we might pick a, you know, some of these books that may have 30, 40 references. My book probably has more than 1,000 medical wow. references in them. And they, it's almost like a textbook of longevity science. And a lot of people take these books and be able to see the reference, and they can use the books in, like a, in a college course for, for mm-hmm. nutritional human longevity, too. So I'm really making it for people who are the health enthusiast, you know? That's great. Where can people find out more information about you and your books? DrFurman.com is D-R-F-U-H-R-M-A-N.com. You can get books on my website, on Amazon, any, any bookstores, you know. But And then my on my website, there's a, a tab for retreats. And if people are, have some medical issues and they need my help, they can stay at a retreat here in San Diego. And I do have, and I do also have on the website the ability for people to join a membership where they can communicate with myself and my medical staff through forums where they can get advice on their medical conditions or their health issues and get personalized advice um, through the internet. So there's some issue where we can give people support and camaraderie and recipes and ideas. And so we do have a website where people can get more information. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. The time was flow flew by. Yeah, right? went went by quick, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, some really great information. And if you guys want to follow, you know, more information, um, just uh, you know, uh, go on YouTube and and do a search, and you're going to find tremendous amounts of information. That's kind of where I first found out about you. I saw you doing some talks and doing some seminars and stuff, and I started to follow along, and I was like, oh. This is pretty different than what we're normally hearing. So mm-hmm. thanks again for coming out here. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you all later.